significant fire only remains to, to make uh, the achievement of getting all 379 uh, souls on board off all the more impressive. Um, Tim Atkinson, uh, air traffic uh, investigator, is with us. Uh, so is uh, Roger Whitfield, a former commercial uh, pilot. Um, let's bring in Tim just first of all again. Um, with this picture, Tim, I, I don't know if you're watching it, but uh, we're seeing that moment when... Uh, the A350 aircraft uh, carrying 379 people, significantly sized aircraft, caught uh, on fire as it hit the runway. And, and the scale of that fire immediately as it broke out, uh, is that a surprise to you, Tim, uh, given what we've been learning? Not that the fire developed as it did, but again, that achievement to get everyone off, off the plane, uh, all the more significant. Well, that, that's the first time I've seen this clip continuing for as long as it is. And I think what we're seeing is um, the A350 on its landing roll um, then uh, is in collision with the second aircraft. That's what makes sense of these images. Uh, it appears at that moment to lose its nose landing gear because from that moment onwards, it's sliding along the runway with the nose of the aircraft in contact with the runway surface, but it appears to me that the main landing gear uh, is still extended. Uh, we can see fire from the underside of the uh, nose of the A350. Um, there's clearly a huge release of combustible material at the moment of, of collision. And uh, my conjecture, but it would be a fairly solid conjecture, would be that that is fuel from the Coast Guard aircraft so I'm thinking the Coast Guard aircraft has come off very badly indeed in this particular collision. Um, and the fire there, which remains at the, uh, at the point of impact, uh, is a very fierce, uh, high-temperature fire. Uh, we can uh, see, you know, good, good reason to, to be very fearful for the uh, other occupants of the Coast Guard aircraft. As the A350 um, moves out of site to the left of these images. Uh, there's fire taking hold there as well, um, quite clearly. Uh, and uh, it, the next thing that I, I'd be very interested to see would be um, the moments afterwards uh, as the evacuation begins. I don't know whether we'll be fortunate to have some footage of that uh, in a few moments. We are awaiting further footage to come in. Of course, we'll bring it to people as soon as they have it. You've got a live shot on your left. Uh, of uh, the ongoing fire, which, of course, has seen the fuselage now split in the middle uh, and a repeat uh, clip on the right-hand side of your screen of uh, that moment where the fire broke out as the plane was landing. Roger Whitfield, former commercial uh, pilot, is with us as well. Roger, your take on what the pilots and the crew achieved in the moments between these two images that we're looking at? Well, well I think... You know, first of all, you've got to say that we've just witnessed a miracle. The, the way they got all those passengers off that aeroplane is almost beyond belief. If you go back to one of your original pictures of smoke pouring out of one of the rear doors, the, the visibility inside that aeroplane must have been nil. And for the crew to have got all the passengers out is a miracle. Um, there's no two ways about it. Um, what, what about the pilot? I mean, uh, both whether or not they should have seen the Coast Guard plane or whether that's uh, something uh, of a fault of air traffic control or whatever the equivalent is at this airport. Uh, too um, early. And, and, or, uh, and, and then linked to that, the, the achievement of still landing the plane. Well, I, I think it's too early to say someone should have seen and someone should have not seen or the air traffic control should have sorted it out. The, if, you, if you look at the... The pictures on the right, you will see that the the, the 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 big Boeing is actually on the ground. It's not in the flare. The nose is not up in the air. Um, and the impact must have been nose gear and left-hand engine against um, the, the other aeroplane, the type unknown. Um, whether, because you don't know what the aeroplane was, the Coast Guarder, and you don't know what its attitude was, in other words, was it on the runway facing down the runway thinking it was clear to take off, or was, did it think that it was holding short of the runway and therefore um, at 90 degrees to it? Um, you, you really don't know what the visual aspect was. Um, 
no doubt it'll all come out in the wash. Um, the ground movement radar, um, the captain from the Coast Guard will be around somewhere um, in, a, in a position to tell all sooner rather than later, I expect. Um, and, and we have all the crew um, from the Japan Airlines flight. And, and Roger, just talk me through what you, you might guess that the mindset would have been uh, for the pilot, the, the, the man at the helm who had these lives uh, in his hands, as presumably he saw the Coast Guard aircraft a matter of seconds before he ended up hitting it, and, and the sense of calmness, I guess, that would have been needed to still, even though he'd already landed, perhaps, uh, bring this aircraft to a, to a safe halt and uh, instruct his crew to get everybody off the plane? This, this would have been um, a, a total surprise to everybody on the flight deck of, of the Boeing. Um, because if they'd seen it beforehand, they would have gone around or tried to, but no one did. Um, and once you've... Well, the first thing you would have known is, is it had hit something. In the undercarriage, the nose gear would have come off. The nose would have dropped on the ground. There would have been a lot of noise as it was scraped along the runway. Um, there would probably be fire warnings going off on the left engine. There would be a fair amount of confusion, to say the least. And this is where pilot training takes over. As soon as you call for a checklist, you go into train mode and, and you get things going. And the first thing to do is, is, is to initiate the evacuation. Um, it's no good sort of waiting till the aircraft comes to a stop and then getting on the PA and saying, cabin crew, use doors so and so. You've got to start it going and then you'll get some of the people off. The fact they got all of the people off is a miracle. Amelia Harper is with me here on Set Sky News Correspondent. I do just want to uh, do a full recap for those viewers that are just joining us of uh, what we have learnt uh, over the course of the last uh, hour or so in these extraordinary uh, pictures. Amelia, just to remind our viewers exactly what we've been watching. Mm, well, first and foremost, I think we should say first that all 379 plus passengers and crew on board have been evacuated from that plane that we can see on the screen right now. Extensive damage, extensive fire that we can see there. We're beginning to understand this aircraft might have hit uh, another aircraft after landing. Of course, that's not quite yet confirmed, but this is what is starting to emerge, the picture of this uh, incident. We can see CCTV. Now, that's on the right of our screen now, showing the plane travelling down the runway, having burst into flames. We think, looking at that, starting on the underside, it's not exactly clear whether it hits something there or not. But the Jap Japan Coast Guard says it's looking into possibilities that one of its planes collided with the Japan Airlines flight in Haneda Airport. And the Coast Guard has said that five out of its six crew are unaccounted for. So, of course, uh, that will be uh, an ongoing investigation for those people there. A Japan Airlines spokesperson says the aircraft that, it, that is in flames is a Japanese airline flight 516 from Shin Chitose Airport on Hokkaido Island heading to Haneda. And, of course, this is one of Japan's busiest airports. Lots of passengers will have been there and will still be there uh, over this festive period trying to fly back and forth from wherever they need to be. But all runways at that airport have now closed. But really dramatic footage that we are seeing. And you can see those uh, sort of uh, marks at the back there. That is actually the, the interior of the plane, the structural elements of the plane there. So really shocking footage and firefighters will be continuing to, evac uh, to, to try to put out this, this fire as soon as possible, really. We do just have, uh, Amelia, thank you for that uh, uh, summary of what we've learned so far. We just had a further line cross and it comes from the Kyoto uh, Tokyo Fire Department and uh, they're saying that the remaining five Japan Coast Guard crew on board the crashed aircraft have been found, condition unknown. Uh, so we are all hoping and praying uh, for a positive update uh, on that, um, albeit, of course, we have seen some very worrying pictures uh, in the last couple of hours as it relates to them. A, a report from the Coast Guard uh, about 15 minutes ago, of course, said that one of the six, the captain, uh, had managed to escape. The other five had been uh, uh, unaccounted for. They're now accounted for. 
albeit condition unknown. We'll bring you that update as soon as we have it. Uh, with me is Roger Whitfield, a former commercial pilot. Uh, Terry Toza is able to join us too, a former uh, commercial pilot himself and an airline safety expert. And also with us, Tim Atkinson, uh, an air traffic investigator. Tim, I just want to come to you uh, again because we've had uh, quite a lot of new pictures to us. Uh, over the last uh, 15 minutes and if it, if it brought you any further updates or insights as to, to what initially uh, did take place. Uh, no, I mean, un unsurprisingly, we're focusing here on, on very sensational um, imagery of the A350 burning. Uh, this is all after the event from the investigator's perspective. What's of interest is to, to know why the two aircraft were where they were. Um, and uh, the precise dynamics of the collision which appears to have taken place and the consequences of that, um, in particular focusing on the fire. Um, the uh, images we looked at a short while ago of the, the continuing landing roll of the A350 after the moment of collision when all of that fuel is released and the fire begins, um, yes, we're just seeing it on the right of the screen uh, now. Uh, that's that's you know starting to tell quite a clear story, um, uh, and uh, from that, uh, investigators will will uh, along with all of the other material, of course, and and I should say that it's almost um, uh, a hazard of the investigators' world now the volume of material that uh, that one must work through following an event like this. You know, CCTV, um, everyone has a, has a phone with them nowadays. People take a lot of video and photographs and so forth. In amongst all of that evidence, there will be very valuable material which, will, um, which can be pieced together um, to, to develop a, a clear understanding of, uh, of, of the sequence of events here from analysing that sequence of events and asking why did each one happen. Uh, we can begin to uh, build an understanding of, of, of the, the causes, um, uh, the, 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 the fundamental and, and, um, uh, and, and, and less fundamental causes, uh, and building up a picture. And then from all of that, uh, working out whether there are any of those you know, things which people refer to as lessons to be learned. Um, really, learning lessons from this kind of thing is, is, is not the best way to improve statistical safety. Um, aviation is a statistical safety game. Um, the statistics are very good indeed, but they're not absolute. You know, it's not zero harm. This kind of thing happens extremely rarely, but it does happen. Um, I want to bring in um, Terry Toza, former pilot and airline safety expert. And, uh, and Terry, in that moment uh, after the fire began, uh, to the moment when all the passengers and the crew were successfully evacuated off the plane. I, I guess a lot of the safety procedures that no doubt you, you often are involved with reviewing kicked into action and really delivered. Yes, I mean, first of all, I, I don't claim to be an expert. I'm just a former airline pilot who writes about this stuff. Um, but, um, yeah, I mean, basically, evacuation, it wouldn't have been much of a question for the captain and the crew on the flight deck or the cabin crew, given the circumstances. They would have automatically gone into um, emergency evacuation mode and, and clearly they did a very good job. Um, you know, Japan has an outstandingly good safety record. Um, Japanese airlines and their whole environment is, is excellent. So um, it, it's, um, it's very unusual for something like this to happen there. Terry, is there credit due as well to the, uh, the airplane manufacturer? I mean, this, uh, I believe it's an Airbus A350. Uh, French manufacturer, of course, Airbus. Uh, the fact that this fire obviously was not insignificant from, from the moment uh, it, it began, and, and yet, yes, it's taken hold of the fuselage and destroyed the plane pretty much now, but uh, held off sufficiently to give this window to evacuate everyone. Yeah, I mean, obviously, um, everything works as it should, and, um, you know, well, it's a, a huge relief to everybody involved, yeah. Ian Atkinson, uh, sorry, Tim Atkinson, excuse me, uh, air traffic investigator, just want to bring you back in on that point. I mean, is it a surprise to you, an aircraft that's presumably fairly full of fuel? Maybe there was luck that it was at the end of its flight and there was less fuel perhaps on it. But is it a surprise to you that um, the, the fire, when we look at that image on the right of the screen, which was, uh, as I said, not insignificant from, from the word go, didn't take hold in a more uh, damaging way quicker than it did? Um, I, I'm, I'm 
sticking fairly closely to my hypothesis that the fuel released there is is from the Coast Guard aircraft. Uh, you know, presumably it's departing. We've heard that uh, in news reports that it was preparing for departure, so it will have a reasonable load of fuel on it. Uh, I have had a few moments to to look at the kinds of aircraft that the Coast Guard operate there, um, and the data I see in, involves uh, mention of the um, the Beechcraft King Air and the De Havilland Dash Eight, um, which are respectively uh, aircraft of kind of around, around five or six tons and, and twenty or so tons. Um, the uh, fuel released from the Coast Guard aircraft, I think, is is what we see burning uh, immediately after the moment of collision. I'm going to revise my um, uh, thoughts on the nose landing gear of the A350. I think that looks still extended, actually, but what appears to have happened is that the collision is under the nose of the A350 and, and maybe burning wreckage is carried under the nose of the A350 or something along those lines has gone on. Um, the uh, a350 would be landing, I presume, unless it's doing what's called tankering, which is where, for economic reasons, the aircraft carries a lot more fuel than it needs. It would have a, a typical landing fuel load of several tonnes. Um, uh, and uh, the uh, interestingly, again, reflecting on the images that we're seeing, uh, I'm not seeing what appears to be uh, a major fuel fire from the tanks of the A350, which will be in the inboard sections of the wings. Um, so uh, I think that the fuel that we're seeing burning is, is mostly Coast Guard aircraft fuel, and it's mostly left there at the, at the site of the collision, although some is carried along as the A350 continues its landing roll. And, and Roger Whitfield is still with us, former commercial pilot. And Roger, an Airbus A350, I mean, we, we can tell this, of course, from the number of passengers on board 367 who were thankfully evacuated along with 12 crew, 379 in total. This is a big plane. Uh, the flight from the Sapporo area to Tokyo, I believe, is, is under two hours. So it's perhaps very big for, for that sort of length of flight for uh, a European flight. But, but for, for British... Uh, viewers context this sort of size plane is usually used for what a, a transatlantic flight or, or something of that length this is basically a long haul airplane um but that doesn't mean to say that you don't use them on short haul routes or the fact that it, it i don't know it might well have been going on and flying on to outside, outside asia um for i know i think looking at these pictures it for people who are old like me it is reminiscent of the British Airways 737 that caught fire on the runway in Manchester many years ago. The, the reason I bring the subject up is that the Air Accident Investigation Branch, the UK version of it, did a very thorough investigation into the causes and made some recommendations which fortunately were not taken up. Because if those recommendations, recommendations had been taken up, such as every passenger put a smoke hood on, you wouldn't have had the evacuation rate that you got here today and you wouldn't have saved as many lives. And, and uh, Tim Atkinson, air traffic investigator, is, is still with us. I mean, do you, do you agree with that? Is, is this, uh, as you look at things, perhaps not a case of needing to, to learn new lessons to, to avoid a repeat, but, but, but an example of where things largely, despite, of course, the, the fact that we are awaiting the... Uh, status of uh, five of the six Coast Guard passengers, that largely the, at least, procedures did did help the situation, if if not even work? Well, yeah, I mean, it seems for those on board the Airbus that everything has gone very well indeed. Um, to touch on safety recommendations that the, the, from my 12 years at the Air Accidents Investigation Branch, um, one of our uh, mottos was that one event makes for a poor recommendation. Um, th there's been a history of um, thought processes around making evacuations um, more effective, uh, such as by incorporating uh, water mist sprays into the cabin to make the cabin environment um, more sustaining of life, such as um, getting passengers into smoke hoods, which I, I think is, is pure fantasy, and I'm, I'm very pleased that that wasn't. Um, pursued. To my mind, the very best thing is to get everyone out of the aircraft as rapidly as possible with absolutely nothing delaying that process. Um, technology such as the use of penetrating lances to put water spray and, and other spray, you know, into 
the cabin environment uh, have been trialled. I think they're in use here and there. Um, but fundamentally, the key to a successful evacuation is simply getting the doors open, making sure the slides deploy and getting the people out as rapidly as they possibly can. And once again, I'll, I'll mention um, the excellent work that was done in the UK over many years at Cranfield University, uh, which really has contributed in, in a very powerful way to the uh, evacuation standards that we see uh, across um, aviation worldwide. Um, and, and the successful nature of many evacuations uh, we observe, which leave us wondering, you know, as other correspondents here have said, how, uh, how they've been so successful. I, I'm still waiting to see um, imagery of the first kind of three minutes after the aircraft comes to a halt um, uh, and to see what the environment was like there, to see which exits were opened, uh, which slides deployed correctly, what the behaviour of the passengers were. In slower time, I would hope that investigators will look at things like flow rates of passengers down those slides. Uh, I'll, I'll touch on a couple of other things which are pertinent. The passengers from this aircraft need to be interviewed individually as soon as possible to gather their recollections, to work out who was sitting where, to work out which exit each person used to find out what they thought made their evacuations easier or more difficult. Um, we'll need to gather any imagery uh, that was taken in the cabin. I would expect these days there will be people who've got their phones out and are videoing the record, video recording the evacuation from inside the cabin. That will be uh, enormously valuable. Um, we, do, we do expect him some uh, internal uh, video pictures and we're about to be able to bring them to you and we'll bring it as soon as they're ready to go. Um, but t Tim, very legitimate questions for, of course, the investigation. Um, and we can tell uh, from, from your point of view on that that that's clearly uh, what, what you do for a living. But, but just the fact that that's what we're talking about, as opposed to a bigger tragedy. I, I wonder if you can give us some context there. When something like this, a full-scale evacuation of a plane, is required, H how rare is it that, that it's successful? I, I mean, often, I guess, if it's required, it would be because there's a risk the impact is, is devastating in the first place or the fire takes hold quicker. Is this a, a real once-in-a-lifetime a escape for the 379 uh, on board? Well, one would hope so. Um, I mean, it would be extraordinarily unfortunate for someone to be involved in two of these events in their lifetime, and, and it would be statistically extremely improbable. Um, it, in terms of the uh, success of um, the evacuation, um, uh, it, it, it is remarkable. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's a miracle. The pictures we're seeing are, are, are very sensational. Um, but as we watch again the, the continuing landing roll of the A350, although there's some burning underneath it, um, although we know that that fire then takes hold, uh, it, it's, it's really of interest to me to, to see what follows. In terms of making a decision to evacuate and the probability of injury or death, um, this is particularly important in the training of airline pilots and especially the training of airline commanders. There used to be a perspective that an evacuation on a medium or wide body aircraft probably involved, uh, I've heard it put as signing somebody's death warrant. That is palpably from the data no longer the case. Um, the questions for a commander in deciding to evacuate are, is the environment in the cabin stable or unstable, and is it life-threatening or not life-threatening? If it's life-threatening, you evacuate. If it's not life-threatening but unstable, that is where you make your money, that is where you make your uh, decision, potentially a life-changing decision for some, uh, and on the balance of the evidence available to you, you may evacuate or you may not evacuate. If it's not life-threatening and it's stable, then don't evacuate. Um, clearly, this is this is not going to be a difficult decision for the commander of that Airbus. Um, it's very obvious to me that, that the, the conditions in the cabin will have been life-threatening and unstable, so it's straight into an evacuation. Um, well, we have three uh, former commercial airline pilots with us still as well. Terry Tozer, uh, Roger Whitfield, and joining us now, uh, Alistair Rosenshine, um, uh, who is also an aviation expert. He was a... British Airways 747 pilot. So, uh, Alistair, to, to bring you in, ha 
I guess first quick question, um, have you, did you ever have to instruct uh, your, your passengers to evacuate a plane or, or not? No, came very close to it on a couple of occasions. Um, uh, and one of them was, in fact, when we had a, a serious smoke incident on the aircraft. Um, I wished to get the aircraft on the ground in 12 minutes from 36,000 feet and uh, made the decision not to evacuate because uh, we believed that we'd be able to get them down using the steps, uh, using um, the slides can involve uh, injuries and you only do it if you think that um, the situation is so dire that you've got to get the passengers off very quickly. But in this particular incident here, now we can see these videos, um, the aircraft, uh, the A350 was during its landing roll. Uh, a very short notice of pilots may have seen this uh, aircraft that's incurred in, you know, with the runway incursion with another aircraft. Uh, they have no possibility of avoiding the accident at that point. So once the collisions happened, the flight crew will want to bring the aircraft to halt as quickly as possible, uh, shut down the engines and initiate the evacuation. That is, that is part of the training. That is as it will be going through the minds of the pilots. And then we might add also, from a pilot's point of view, once the evacuation has started and the flight crew have completed their shutdown checks on the flight deck. They will then enter the cabin, and uh, it is their job to see that everybody has evacuated. And obviously, you know, if there's a fire in there, they may not be able to check the whole cabin. But that is what they do, and then they are the very last ones to leave the aircraft. But the evacuation is carried out by uh, the cabin crew, and uh, as we've heard, they managed to get everybody off successfully. So their trainings come in, um, their professionalism. Uh, will be highlighted in the investigation when, when it finally is done. But, you know, the flight crew's job is over once uh, the aircraft shut down and the passengers are off. Forgive me for interrupting, Alice. I just want to bring uh, our viewers now some pictures that we do have from inside the aircraft, uh, taken, uh, of course, presumably by a passenger on their phone. Uh, and uh, I think you can see there a glimpse of probably the fire that was at the front of the aircraft that we've been witnessing from uh, the other side, of course, from those distant CCTV images. And, uh, of course, it's short, it's on loop. You also see some of the smoke that's uh, gathering at some point later on uh, within the fuselage and the cabin. Um, Tim Atkinson, air traffic investigator, is, is with us. And, Tim, does this sort of confirm to you any details that we've been uh, learning or, or, or putting together over the last hour or two? Give us your take on, on this first image that we've had from inside the cabin. Well, yeah, it's it's not the kind of environment we've been looking at in, in the imagery of this very well-developed fire uh, of the aircraft after the event. Uh, and in fact, I've also just received a, a, an image, which I'll, I'll maybe send into you if a moment if I can, of the outside of the aircraft, um, just as the evacuation is finishing. And it's a much more benign environment um, than one might have expected to see. Yes, there's some smoke, of course, but not so much smoke that visibility is impaired and understanding where you are in your environment uh, is difficult. Um, the passengers appear to be relatively calm in those images. That's another important thing. Um, so uh, it, it sort of emboldens my view that, that this is, is a very uh, successful evacuation, clearly. Um, uh, and one of the reasons for that is that the, the uh, imagery we've been looking at of, of this very uh, fierce, very intense fire uh, developed uh, well after the uh, evacuation was complete. Um, I just wanted to mention as well, Tim, that uh, the Coast Guard has confirmed that the aircraft uh, that uh, was involved on their side, it's a Bombardier-8. What, what's your take on that? Yeah, um, one of the types that I mentioned a few moments ago. So it, it's an aircraft which um, is uh, typically a sort of short-haul commuter airliner, 50 to 80 seats or so, um, but in a special mission role such as Coast Guard work, yeah, it's, it's, it's a fine machine for that. It's got long endurance, it's a reliable platform. It can carry a lot of kit and so forth. Um, uh, the volume of fuel... On that is, if you're saying it typically carries 80 people, it's uh, even though there was only six Coast Guard uh, members on board, it, it's not a small plane. 
Uh, no, uh, a, a weight of 20-something tonnes um, uh, and uh, not, not anything like the size of the A350s, which we're seeing um, in the imagery here, um, but nonetheless, you know, the, the kind of aircraft that you'd fly on maybe from Southampton to Edinburgh, uh, to put it in the context people might, um, might be familiar with. Um, uh, clearly, you know, sizable enough to have a, a significant volume of fuel on board. It, it certainly makes perfect sense of the, uh, the post-impact um, fire we see develop there. Um, it, it would be interesting to calculate the height of the engine the cell of the, the number one um, engine on the A350 and see whether that corresponds with the height of the wing on the Dash 8. Um, it wouldn't be at all a surprise if it does. That would start to put together uh, an understanding of the uh, collision dynamics. Uh, and Just in Coast Guard role, yeah, uh, it, you, you wouldn't have the back of the Dash 8 full of seats, of course. It would be full of all kinds of specialist equipment for searching and imaging and, and possibly rescue equipment as well. You know, airdroppable rescue equipment is, is typically carried. Coast Guard aircraft also, in many parts of the world, get involved in things like submarine hunting. Um, so they might have kit on board mm -hmm. like that. And six would be a very, a very typical sort of number of crew for a, a routine mission of that nature. Just uh, we want to bring back in Roger Whitfield, a former commercial uh, pilot. And uh, Roger, we just saw the first pictures from inside uh, the cabin. And I, I just wonder if you could talk us through the different roles uh, of the pilot and, and the cabin crew and those in charge of the cabin crew at a moment like this. Does the pilot stay completely separate? The door stays locked? They focus uh, on the plane's travel uh, and let the cabin crew look after look after the cabin and how important is the the pilot's voice coming over the tannoy to keep the passengers calm is it is a bit of teamwork involved or are their roles quite separate uh, these days it, it is um a separate role um the the, the the flight deck crew will secure the airplane that's their first job they've got to make sure that nothing is burning well when i say burning i mean no engines are on the apu is off Everything is shut down um, so that anyone who gets out of the aeroplane will not be injured. Once they have done that, their job is then to go and help the cabin crew. But when I say help, I don't mean interfere, and, but they're, they're there as extras. If you think about it, if you come out of the flight deck, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to go and meet head on with all the passengers coming the other way who are trying to get out the front two doors. And the last thing you want to do is to be in the way. However, because you are responsible for all those passengers, you wait until they're all off, and then you go through the aeroplane and check they've all gone. Um, it doesn't take long. Um, I had to evacuate an aeroplane once, and it took about a minute and a half, um, and I, I went the whole length of the aeroplane and got off the back. Talk us through that moment and uh, your experience, Roger, of, of having to give that instruction. Was there panic in the, in the aircraft? Are you surprised from that video clip that we saw uh, internally of the plane that there wasn't more panic? Well, I was surprised there was, was, was not, not as much panic. Because the visibility was good, um, and that always helps keep maintain um, a, a, a better feeling inside the cabin. If you can see what's going on, um, it is much more important than hearing what's going on. Um, the other thing is, of course, is that if you can see what's going on, you can see your way out and you can see who you're going to follow or will push out of the way, depending on how they are. Um, it'll be interesting to see how uh, the infirmed and, and the disadvantaged got on in this, because that was a very full aeroplane and to see what the outcome was um, for those who, who were, were perhaps not as physically fit um, will be interesting. I think there will be a lot will be learned by this, but most of it will reinforce that what you're doing at the moment, you're doing right. I do just want to bring in Alice uh, uh, Rosenshine again, and, uh, again a, a former BA pilot and uh, safety expert. Al Alice, your, your take on those internal images and again from your experience of having to nearly call for an evacuation yourself, uh, the, the, the way that uh, everyone stayed calm and uh, your take on, on the crew achieving that? Uh, well, yes. Um, first of all, I agree with what Roger said there. Um, you know, 
as uh, as uh, Roger said, uh, there was not too much smoke in the cabin, at least on that uh, initial clip, and that does make a difference um, in helping the evacuation. You know, the, there is also a cultural aspect here. Uh, Japanese people react in a different way from European people, and um, I think they're much more orderly and much more likely to obey instructions and uh, carry out the evacuation in an, in an orderly fashion. So. You know, that is a factor which, you know, as I say, this, this cultural aspect will have played a part in this incident. Um, but, you know, the, the evacuations obviously worked out well. And, um, you know, once the aircraft comes to a halt, getting those passengers off, that is the absolute top priority. Nothing else matters at that point except doing that. And the flight crew's point, uh, as Roger has also mentioned, is to go and check that everybody's off and to give a good, thorough look, and then, of course, to get off the aircraft oneself. One doesn't want to become a casualty. Um, let's bring in now uh, Tony Cable, a former senior inspector at the UK uh, Air Accidents uh, Investigation uh, branch. And, uh, Tony, you, you, your take quickly on, on that that we were just discussing. I don't know if you caught the end of that, but uh, we're talking about the calmness of the passengers, the fact that everyone was off uh, fairly quickly, it seems, in a relatively orderly manner. From your experience investigating these things, is that, is that always what happens? Well, clearly not always. Um, I mean, the certification requirement is to evacuate all the occupants from half the exit in 90 seconds. And um, there are tests done to... Uh, Try to demonstrate that this can be the case. Uh, and uh, and your take so far on, on what we've learned about this uh, this incident. And uh, I, I guess we were talking with uh, Tim Atkinson, a, a peer of yours, and and one of the key points has been that perhaps the fire on the plane itself, the the Airbus, did not take hold until uh, kind of once passengers started to get off. As much as those pictures as it was landing suggest otherwise. Well, there's clearly been a, a massive fuel release which has ignited um, and the the danger is of coming to a halt with fuel coming out that's burning and uh, will probably burn through the fuselage fairly rapidly, at which point you then get uh, tend to get a lot of um, nasty toxic chemical gases uh, produced which uh, can knock people out fairly rapidly. Um, As we approach the, uh, the end of this hour of coverage, we're not going to leave the coverage, fear not, um, uh, but uh, I, I want to bring in Amelia Harper again, our Sky News correspondent, to j just to remind any viewers that are, have been tuning in for, for a full summary of, of what we know uh, at this point. That's right. Well, for those that are just joining us, the plane that we can see, the fire on the left-hand screen, is from the plane. It's a Japanese airline plane on the runway at Tokyo's Haneda Airport. You can see on the right there it landed and burst into flames. Firstly, all 379-plus passengers and crew on board this A350 uh, that we can see on the screen there on the left have been evacuated from the Japanese airline plane. We now know that this fire is as the result of two planes colliding. Now, the Japan Coast Guard says its plane, an MA722, a Bombardier Dash 8, collided with this Japan Airlines flight at the airport. The Coast Guard had said that five out of six crew were unaccounted for. They are now accounted for, but their condition is unknown. The captain of that Coast Guard plane did manage to escape. The Coast Guard has also said that that plane was on its way to Niigata Airport to deliver earthquake aid. Of course, this is just one day after that 7.6 magnitude earthquake hit the west coast of Japan. More details, a Japanese airline spokesperson says the aircraft that is in flames on the left of our screen is a Jap Japanese airline flight 516 from Shin Chitose Airport on Hokkaido Island, flying to Tokyo's Haneda Airport. At the moment, all runways at Haneda have now been closed. This is one of Japan's busiest airports. It's one of the world's busiest airports. And, of course, lots of people will have been there uh, over the festive period. 
Uh, and what's happening on the left of the screen now is lots of firefighters, lots of fire engines, appliances are still attempting to put out the flames. We saw uh, live on air earlier that the back half of the plane actually collapsed onto the floor, that the damage was so extensive. The right-hand side of the screen, we've got CCTV footage of that Japanese Airlines flight landing on the runway and further social media footage as well from inside the aircraft has shown passengers looking out of the window seeing orange, there we go, seeing orange under the out of that left-hand window under the side of the plane there. And further footage we also have is showing smoke inside, there we go, of the aircraft there. Passengers doing their best to uh, find out what's going on and disembark safely. Tim, we've, uh, we've got a minute or two left uh, before we take a very quick break, but uh, on that final point, the calmness that we're witnessing there amongst uh, the passengers, despite seeing flames out of the left of the window, I mean, what, what is your take on, on how calm they were during that moment? I mean, personally, I, I, I'm sure I'd be quite the opposite. Uh, yes, I mean, one might hypothesise that one would. I think being in an actual situation um, as it presents and develops itself uh, is very different from sitting and thinking about how one might behave. And the um, things which someone said earlier about um, different cultures around the world and expected norms of behaviour um, may also be very interesting here. Certainly those people don't appear to be panicking. Um, they also don't appear to be moving um, either, which is good. You know, the aircraft is, is still on its landing roll during those images that we're seeing at the moment. Um, but there's plenty of notice to these people that something is going wrong and they're going to have to do something very shortly. And that's not just for the passengers, but for the crew as well. You know, they, they have got a little time here, maybe only a couple of tens of seconds, to think about what's going on, think about how they're going to respond to it, uh, work out a plan, execute that plan. It's not a difficult or complicated plan. Evacuating an aircraft is a very straightforward, very linear sequence of decisions and events, or one decision, uh, followed by a couple of other decisions for those manning individual doors to make uh, as to whether conditions outside are suitable for evacuation or not. Um, and then for the passengers um, to, to get on and get out as rapidly as they can. Uh, uh, and again, to, to echo other remarks, yeah, the, the condition of those on board, um, you know, it, it looks from those images of the, as if there are a lot of um, fairly sort of middling aged um, fit people. There will undoubtedly have been some infants. Uh, I'd be astonished if there weren't some elderly people, possibly frail people, possibly wheelchair users. You know, again, very interesting when everyone survives to work out how those least well able to look after themselves um, also uh, came to, to a, a, a safe conclusion um, through these events. Um, mm -hmm. And that, that is all yeah. material I hope the investigators here will work through because there'll be good learning in it. Well, uh, just to remind our viewers, we've been watching a live shot of uh, Japan uh, Flight 516 uh, uh, burning on the runway at Haneda Airport, uh, though all 379 on board were evacuated. We're going to take a very short break uh, and ongoing coverage of this situation when we come back. Don't go anywhere.
terrified. It is 11 o'clock. If you're just joining us, we're bringing you this breaking news that a Japan Airlines plane has caught fire on the runway at Tokyo's Haneda Airport after colliding with a Japanese Coast Guard plane. All 379 passengers and crew of the Japan Airlines flight were safely evacuated. The pilot of the Coast Guard plane has also escaped, but the condition of the five other crew members on board is unknown. Cameras caught the moment the plane burst into flames as it landed. It had come in from an airport in Hokkaido in northern Japan that serves Sapporo, roughly an hour 45 minute flight. And this footage, filmed from inside the plane by a passenger, also shows the moment uh, that the Japan Airlines plane was landing. Flames quite visible there outside the left-hand window. Uh, smoke inside the cabin also visible there. Uh, let's uh, go to our reporter, Amelia Harper, who's here with me uh, on set. And, uh, Amelia, we've learned a lot over the last hour and a half and witnessed some extraordinary uh, pictures. Just bring us up to speed on, on all that we know at this point. Terrifying footage emerging from Tokyo's Haneda Airport. So on the screen there we have what are the remnants of a Japanese airline plane on the runway at this airport. First, I should say that all 379-plus passengers and crew on board the A350 that we see there on our screen behind some of that smoke have been evacuated from that plane. We now know that this fire is as a result of two planes colliding. And as we saw just there, social, uh, social media footage from inside the plane showing orange flames from under the side and out of that plane window and smoke from inside uh, the cabin as it came down the runway. There we have it there, bumpy footage there, orange out that left-hand window and passengers inside. Uh, we will see some smoke inside that cabin in a second. Now, the Japan Coast Guard says its plane, MA722, a Bombardier Dash 8, collided with a Japan Airlines flight in Haneda Airport. The Coast Guard had previously said five of the six crew were unaccounted for. They are now accounted for, but their condition is unknown. The captain of the Coast Guard plane did manage to escape. And this plane was on its way to Nagata Airport to deliver earthquake aid. This, of course, just the day after a 7.6 magnitude earthquake hit the west coast uh, of Japan. Now, the plane that we can... You can just see the tip there uh, in the back of that shot. Uh, this is this Japan Airline Flight 516. It was coming from Shinchitose Airport on Hokkaido Island to Haneda. And, of course, due to the scale of this incident, all runways at this airport have now been closed. But as you can see there, huge devastation all the way inside the plane, stretching the whole length of the aircraft. Hugely flammable. We'll have landed with lots of fuel. Um, let's bring in uh, Tim Atkinson, uh, a former pilot and air traffic investigator who's uh, been with us uh, for a large part of the morning. Tim, there's uh, a big picture question to, to recap for us. To, to what extent do you, do you think this was uh, somewhat of a miracle that, that all 379 souls on board that Japan Airlines flight that we're looking at now, uh, clearly uh, pretty much destroyed by fire, uh, was that a remarkable achievement? I, I wouldn't say it was a miracle. Um, I, I would say it's um, remarkable only in the way that uh, many events in aviation which have potential to be really calamitous, in fact, play out much better than that. Um, the, the things that interest my brain more are why things happen and uh, how they could be prevented from happening in the future uh, and whether the things which should have prevented them were effective or not. And I've got an awful lot of thoughts running through my mind, as any investigator would have um, when looking at uh, an event like this. Um, it, it's clearly fabulous news that all those on the A350 um, are uh, alive and well. Um, it's clearly very disappointing, but not at all surprising um, that those uh, on the aircraft on the ground, which uh, was uh, involved in the collision um, from a, a stationary start or a nearly stationary start, as, as it appears, uh, didn't do so well. The, the reasons for that are, are very clearly understood in, in uh, collision investigation, whether, whether on, on the road or, 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 or you know, in the aviation context. Um, uh, 
uh, collisions are or aren't survivable for very clearly understood reasons. Um, they're also not something which um, certification standards and so forth take account of. You know, aircraft aren't designed and built to withstand hitting another aircraft in the landing roll. In fact, it's a, uh, a, a very rare event, a collision on a runway, although um, not so rare that, it, that it's not very much at the front and centre of industry radar. Uh, collisions on the ground are one of the uh, hottest dozen or so topics across the industry worldwide, and it's, it's disappointing um, in that context when there's a focus on them uh, to see that another one has occurred, but it's very heartening that the consequences of it are, are not very much worse. Um, I don't want to be at the point where we're trying to point fingers, uh, but, but is somebody at fault for that, whether it's one of the two pilots or the air traffic controls? Is it hard for that just to be a genuine uh, outright, uh, outright sort of error that no one could have uh, corrected for? Well, um, no one goes to work to die. Uh, you know, people go to work to do the best that they can in the circumstances and then bad things happen. And when bad things happen, it's important to, to unpack the reasons why they've happened. Uh, those may be systemic reasons, they may be technical reasons, they may be human reasons. Um, and the job of the air accident investigator is to develop a, a, a thorough understanding, is, is to first gather all the evidence then develop a thorough understanding of the evidence and then work out how the sequence of events which played out, played out. Um, and in the context of this collision, it would be extraordinary um, if there is some uh, deliberate, willful um, misdeed at play. Uh, and, and having discounted that, what I imagine is that we will discover uh, that there is perhaps an error somewhere along the chain. Um, uh, and that error led to the two aircraft being in uh, the same place at the same time, um, when clearly they shouldn't have been. Uh, the consequence of them being in the same place is that they collided, and they collided with the results that we're seeing on the screen. Um, that's one side of it. The other side of it is that there are various systems, particularly to prevent um, collisions on runways, you know, radar-based systems, um, of various kinds exist. It wouldn't be at all surprising to learn that this airport had those systems. Why, in this case, didn't they work? Um, uh, and then we've got the known weaknesses in the system. And I spoke earlier about the uh, difficulty of the nighttime runway environment. You know, uh, as you approach an airport at night, you're looking at a sea of lights of different colours, some flashing, some occulting, some steady some bright, some not bright, some which are there for a specific navigational purpose, some which are there simply to illuminate the ground so that people can work on the ramp, for example. And into that, inject this idealised system that we have of navigation lights and anti-collision beacons, which has its history, you know, a hundred years ago in the earliest aircraft, um, uh, and, and which palpably doesn't work in this very busy visual environment. Um, because as you approach a runway at night, and I've, I've done it, where we're approaching a runway, we know there's an aircraft lined up for departure in front of us, which is going to take off. All we can see is what appears to be a small segment of missing runway lights, of missing centerline runway lights. It's our situational awareness that tells us that there's an aircraft there, and then we see that missing patch of lights, as it were, start to move down the runway. And, of course, what we're watching is the departing aircraft moving along the runway, covering up those centerline lights. That is one situation in this situation where we don't know what the Coast Guard aircraft was doing. Had it moved onto the runway uh, to depart? Was it crossing the runway? H had the crew become uncertain of their position and, and they'd moved onto the runway not realising they'd done so? Uh, you know, all of these are possibilities which the investigators here will have to uh, unpack and, and work through. Um, is there a, an answer? No, there isn't. You know, a lot of work, as I say, is being done on this topic of, of collisions on the ground, and yet they continue to occur. And they continue to occur because preventing them is really, really difficult to do. Um, uh, and, and so I, I wind back to the beginning of this conversation and the, the amazing result that notwithstanding the, the tragic loss of, of five of the six uh, on the Coast Guard aircraft, as is being reported, 
but the, the success of the evacuation of the A350 is, uh, is, is certainly something that uh, I, I think all aviation professionals can regard as, uh, as an industry success. Uh, just to uh, update, we have not yet confirmed the status of the five of the six Coast Guard uh, members on, on the other plane, uh, though uh, one, the captain, uh, we know, did uh, escape. The other five are now accounted for, conditions still unknown. Of course, uh, the imagery we've seen uh, does not uh, uh, mean much uh, hope is, is carried, given the, the, the fire that broke out. We'll update you uh, further details on that when we know. What we do know, of course, is that all 379 souls, 367 passengers plus 12 crew, were successfully evacuated off uh, Japan uh, Airlines Flight 516. Um, let's bring in Alistair Rosenshein again, a uh, former pilot. Um, Alistair, uh, listening there to Tim, he, he framed it as remarkable but but not a miracle that all um 379 aboard the japan airlines flight were evacuated evacuated what's your take on that well yes i, I agree I, I i don't tend to use the word <clears throat> miracle uh when it comes to uh, aviation but um you know it the 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 impact uh, between the two aircraft was such that um it was you know was able to make a proper evacuation, bring the aircraft to a halt and do that evacuation. Um, it could have been so much worse, much worse. Um, um, looking at um, a plan of the airport at Hanida, you can see it's a very complicated uh, set of <clears throat> taxiways and runways. Um, so, you know, at night it can be very easy to make a mistake and uh, enter a runway when you, don't, when you don't intend to do so. And... Uh, you know, one can't really speculate about what happened, but uh, it certainly is a complex airport layout. And uh, at night, one has to be incredibly vigilant as a pilot to make sure that one uh, is in where one should be and uh, doesn't, uh, you know, enter a runway inadvertently. Um, in terms of, uh, again, the, the, uh, Alistair, the calmness with which everyone was, was evacuated, I mean, how, how full was this plane? It's an Airbus uh, A350 carrying 367 passengers. I mean, it's, it's a lot of people to get off. Is that a sort of half-empty plane to, to create perhaps less of a, a bottleneck on, on that process or not? Well, um, each airline operate, um, fits uh, seats in their aircraft depending on uh, seat pitch and uh, leg length they want to do now. If um, in Japan they tend to use these larger aircraft on uh, short haul, uh, in other words, flights within Japan. So here we have a wide-bodied aircraft capable of carrying 400 people. Um, and so with 369 people on board, it sounds to me like it was pretty much full. Um, and, uh, you know, there are, uh, there are training and specific ways in which uh, passengers are evacuated from an aircraft. The fact that they got them off all successfully uh, without losing any lives uh, on, on the A350 is, uh, you know, I would say uh, pretty remarkable considering the, uh, the impact they had and the uh, ball of flames we saw there. So they've done very well to, to, to get them off. But it is within the training, and one has to take into account, once again, I mentioned earlier, the cultural aspect. The Japanese people as a whole are very obedient and uh, if they're asked to evacuate and to do so calmly, they no doubt will have done so. Um, and uh, so that factor was probably working in their favour as well. I want to bring in now uh, Di Whittingham. He's chief executive of the UK Flight Safety Committee and able to join us now. Di, um, what, what is your take on uh, what we've seen uh, over the last couple of hours? And again, I mean, it, it come back to the same point, but uh, whether you... You feel this is quite a, a remarkable outcome, given the scale of the flames, for example, that we're looking at. Well, um, it, it is a remarkable outcome, and I, I think there are some people out there who've been particularly lucky today, uh, and, and a tragedy, of course, for some others. So, um, as earlier um, speakers have said, the investigation will be looking at how these two aircraft came together, as it appears they have. Uh, but of particular interest will be the evacuation uh, and the fact that all 379 occupants were able to evacuate safely. So to start with, you have a, a very complex um, collision dynamic. And 
and there's a bit of luck that will have played its part there, depending on the first point of contact and so on. But um, as you can see from some of the onboard videos, uh, and, and yes, there were people taking videos, uh, that um, the cabin started to fill with smoke quite quickly. So the message to the travelling public here is really important, that if anything like this happens to you, you have one chance and one priority, which is to get yourself off. So these aircraft are all certified to a standard uh, where all passengers and crew from a fully loaded aircraft can be evacuated within 90 seconds with half the doors unavailable. That's the test. And uh, quite often it takes longer than that. And one of the things that slows people up more than anything else is collecting their bags. So you will find most airlines now say, taking nothing with you, leave everything behind. So I am one of those sad people who do not take my shoes off before the takeoff is complete. I always have them on before the approach. I have my passport in my pocket. I have my phone in my pocket. I have my car keys in my pocket, because with that, you can survive most things. Uh, so I don't need to take anything with me. And, wow. and I am focused very much at the phase of how do, I need, how do I get out? Where are my exits? And I listen to the briefings. And you will see across the world passengers who do not listen to the briefings, <clears throat> who do not bother uh, to um, do anything else than get themselves comfortable. So uh, they put themselves at risk. It's an important reminder uh, for everyone to, to follow the rules and watch watch the briefings uh, for sure. Um, Di, perhaps we'll come back to, to the calmness that, that was needed to achieve that evacuation in a moment of the passengers. But another question I have, uh, given your, your expert position as uh, Chief Executive of the UK Flight Safety Committee, um, about what the quality of the aircraft today um, compared to, I, I don't know how long ago, but... Uh, there was huge flames. Maybe it was on the outside uh, from from many minutes before uh, people got off. Clearly, the, the flames took hold, uh, as we've seen in this live image right now, in, in the hours that have followed. But um, would that have been the case five years ago, 20 years ago, that, that this wouldn't have automatically led to, to flames engulfing every aspect of the aircraft? Uh, no, I think one of the differences now is that um, aircraft like the A350 have much more... Uh, composites uh, in their construction, uh, carbon fibre and the like, which which does burn. Uh, so does aluminium, um, but I don't think that's actually relevant because the uh, the composites are lighter weight, it's better for the environment, and so on. And and it's very difficult to engineer an aircraft which is proof against a collision of that sort because to do so would make it so heavy it wouldn't fly, <laughs> which is um, you know that's the straight economics of it. So, so my question, got, um, Di, my question is really the, the other way around, which is, is it not impressive that the, that the fire held off for long enough to get everyone off? Absolutely, absolutely. And um, most of uh, the, the cabins are, are designed so they don't burn through immediately, but you, you can't protect against everything. And, of course, if the cabin has been penetrated by some part of the collision process, uh, and it's the same when aircraft run off runways and, and so on. If the aircraft is being disrupted and you get a breach in the pressure hull, then you will get fumes, um, smoke and fumes in from outside, uh, which can render the inside of the cabin unsurvivable very quickly, which is why there is this real imperative to get yeah. people off um, with as quickly as possible. I want to bring in um, Tim Atkinson and Alistair Rosenshine again in just a moment. But, but Di, for now, my, my next question again is for you, which is... What, do, you, do you think that this sort of outcome... I mean, clearly there's so many wildcard factors at play, but w would, have, would have taken place at, at a UK airport as well? Are you impressed by Haneda Airport, by uh, the Japan Airlines, by, by some of the things that have taken place? Or are you sitting there comfortable that the UK environment is, uh, is pretty effective too? I don't think anybody should be comfortable um, because that complacency is the heart of, of many accidents. So... All airports um, and, and air crews across the system will be looking for this sort of thing. So there have been some close calls recently, uh, particularly in the USA, uh, a runway collision in um, in uh, South America with, with a fire truck that, that ran into the path of a landing aircraft and so on. So these 
These things do happen occasionally, but it's about communication, it's about processes, it's about discipline um, and, and having the right information. So uh, are UK airports immune? No, they're not, because uh, if people make mistakes, and they do, uh, if that leads to a runway incursion, i.e. an incorrect presence on the runway, whether that is another aircraft or a vehicle, uh, you, you can have the same outcome. But um, there's a lot of work that goes in to prevent that. Uh, local runway safety teams uh, are in place, and the UK airports all work very hard to ensure that, that this sort of event doesn't happen. But, uh, you know, you can never say never. Um, Alistair Rosenstein is still with us. He's a former British Airways pilot. Um, Alistair, th does Japan uh, Airlines have a very good reputation for safety and, and indeed Haneda and Tokyo airports? Uh, yes, indeed they do. They're, they're a very highly technical um, uh, people. Um, they are very highly trained. They maintain their aircraft perfectly. And my experience of operating in Japan is uh, one of it being an excellent environment to uh, to operate in. And I just want to add something about uh, the causes, the possible causes of delay in an evacuation. Um, and it was mentioned that uh, passengers sometimes take their bags off. And of course, that can delay. It can also block exits and block uh, the uh, the main path out. But one of the biggest problems one has is when families are separated in aircraft. So um, it, it's become recently airlines started charging people to, or in fact, it's not that recent, but started charging people to select their seats. Um, and when they don't do so, uh, they may, a family may uh, board an aircraft and be separated. And in an emergency, what happens is parents start to try to find their children, um, separated couples try to find each other. They may be going in the opposite direction from the exits. And I think that practice of uh, charging passengers for seats uh, has got has got to end and that passengers have to be seated in groups together so families are never separated couples are never separate children are never separated from their parents because we know in an evacuation that that will result in a reduced time to get people off um, that's a really interesting uh, additional take and i can definitely intuitively see how that would play out as a, a delaying factor um, Tim Atkinson is still with us as well, uh, air traffic investigator and a former pilot himself. T Tim, I want to go back to the, uh, the moment this all started and, and whether there's um, any further take, and it, it might be just conjecture at this point, um, but, but interested to get your perspective on it, uh, about the initial collision. And Di uh, w was saying that there's some luck involved, of course, that, that the collision didn't lead to something worse I instantaneously. Do, do you think it means that the Coast Guard plane might have been perpendicular to the Japan Airlines plane? That You were saying earlier, it's actually quite a, quite a big plane, the, the Bombardier Dash 8, perhaps bigger than we initially might have thought from the fact that there was only six passengers on board it. Well, we should say six crew um, rather, crew. rather than passengers, of course. Um, yeah, no, the, the Dash 8 is not insubstantial. You know, it's, it's a typical commuter airliner. Uh, I was remarking earlier on when we looked at some imagery of the uh, number one engine nacelle, um, that the, the, there are some lateral marks across the front of that nacelle, uh, just scribbling with a couple of bits of paper. Um, they seem to be uh, coincident with with where the height of a, a dash eight wing would meet an A350 when it's on the ground, that that would sit very comfortably with with other things that we're seeing in in these images of of the collision. Um, to, to talk a little more about uh, how the dash eight and the A350 come to be in the same place, um, uh, and uh, and also to embellish some of Dai's remarks a moment ago about um, preventing runway collisions. You know, a lot of airports try simply to avoid having aircraft crossing runways. Um, you know, they put taxiways around the end of runways to eliminate that possibility. Um, those kinds of steps uh, work in, in certain circumstances, but, but they're not always reliable because you can't always rely upon them. Um, the, the question of how the two aircraft come to be in the same place is, is undoubtedly the, the most pressing one for investigators here. Um, the, the sequence of events that leads up to that, any long-term factors, short-term factors um, that, that bring that situation about. The survivability of it is, yes, it's interesting, but, it, but it's not interesting from the point of view of 
did the certification requirements work or not because there just aren't any um yes it, it, it's it's great that the a350 fared so well um the images that we're seeing of it continuing to burn well you know th this is like any structure that's been on fire fortunately everybody's out of it yes it'll be destroyed there will be the most almighty cleanup operation which will be very difficult indeed because dealing with burnt composite fibers is extraordinarily tough from a health and safety point of view you know this is going to be enormously disrupting for the airport it's not something where where you can just go out with a dustpan and brush as it were and sweep stuff up the the personal protective equipment and the methods of work and so forth are going to be very demanding indeed uh, in coping with the aftermath of this and I would expect um, the runway on which this occurred to be closed for a very long time and that area of the airport, maybe the whole airport, to be, to be closed or under restricted operations um, for a significant length of time as well. On, on um, that note, um, for, forgive me, sorry, Tim, for interrupting. I just want to bring Di Whittingham in again, Chief Executive of the UK Flight Safety C Committee. I mean, we do understand, Di, that all of the runways on uh, Tokyo's Haneda Airport are closed at the moment. How much of a headache is that for air traffic control? It's not, it's not the issue front and centre of mine today, but as we explore other issues, to, to have to divert planes from what is Tokyo's, Japan's busiest uh, airport, is, is that something itself that's incredibly hard to, to kick into action? Or are there lots of rehearsals about this that if the same, say, applied to, to Heathrow at short notice, would, would everyone still be safe that's, uh, that, that's approaching London uh, and UK airspace? You'll be safe. I mean, one of the reasons that uh, the airport is closed at the moment, of course, is the firefighting capability is all taken up with dealing with a major accident. Uh, and as Tim rightly pointed out, the uh, the issue with um, burnt carbon fibre is um, is a significant one. It's a real health hazard uh, to people who might ingest those small particles. So. Uh, they'll be very careful about that. But if you think back a few years to the closure of Gatwick uh, around Christmas um, when uh, there was a suspected drone incursion, uh, you get massive disruption to the system. So, uh, yes, it's manageable. And no, it's, it's not the end of the world. Uh, they, they will work around it. There is another airport. They will use whatever capacity they've got, but you, you have to assume that until they get some of their runways back open, then um, they will be having to uh, restrict the amount of traffic through the area. And, and that, that's normal business. But just to come back again to the, the, the prevention side of this, there are um, some pretty robust barriers, operational barriers in place to prevent this sort of thing. Um, and you work on a, a, if you like, a buffer system. Mm -hmm. So you have a separation standard that says we need to make sure that nothing gets within 100 metres of a landing aircraft or whatever it happens to be. And uh, if something gets to within 50 metres, you've reduced your safety, but you haven't had an accident. And, of course, on this occasion, we've seen uh, an incursion. If that was the case, then uh, we've seen something that's that's actually where all those barriers have failed. And that is one of the things that the investigation will be looking at. How did these two aircraft actually end up coming together? Because that's at the, the heart of it. Is there a communication issue? Is there a process, a uh, standard operating procedure issue? Uh, you know, what, what triggered this event? And, and part of it uh, m might be, and this is pure speculation, the sense of urgency that will have been going on with the Coast Guard aircraft, which of course was carrying earthquake relief supplies um, to another part of the country. So, you know, there are people with competing priorities and and that might have tripped somebody over one part of a barrier where you know permission had been given when it shouldn't have been. We don't know yet until all those communications have been analyzed and the cockpit voice recorders have been gone through uh, so people can hear exactly what was said by whom and when. Uh, will they start to get to the root of this? But bear in mind, this is a hugely rare event. Commercial air transport is is safer now than it has ever been, despite events like this. Well, Di, uh, Alistair and Tim, thank you all very much. And, and do stick with us. We, we want to, to continue to uh, lean on your expertise and perspective on this. Uh, we're going to take a very quick break, but we will return to our rolling coverage of 
uh, this, uh, this, this, this fire, uh, this collision, uh, at uh, Tokyo's Haneda Airport, uh, where JAL, Japan Airlines Flight 516, uh, collided with a Coast Guard uh, plane. Uh, but despite that collision, despite that fire that you can see and the fact that the fuselage of the plane now has been completely burnt out and destroyed, uh, 379, all 379 lives on board the Japan Airlines flight were saved and evacuated. Uh, five of the six on the Coast Guard flight are uh, still to be confirmed. They are now accounted for. Condition, though, uh, is not yet confirmed. We'll take a very quick break here on Sky News. We'll be back with ongoing coverage in just a moment. But to give us a, a full summary of everything that we, we know at this point, Amelia, um, that's unfolded over the last couple of hours. Well, shocking images that we can see on the screen there. The plane that we can see is a Japanese airline plane that has landed on the runway at Tokyo's Haneda Airport. Firstly, all 379 plus passengers and crew on board this A350 have been evacuated from that Japan Japanese airline uh, plane. And we now know that this fire that we can see there as it's coming down the runway is as a result of two planes colliding when this plane landed. The Japan Coast Guard says its plane, MA722, a Bombardier Dash 8 aircraft, collided with this Japan Airlines flight. And we can now tell you that the state broadcaster NHK is now reporting that five out of the six crew on board have now 
died. The captain on board of that Coast Guard plane did manage to escape, and the Coast Guard plane was on its way to Niigata Airport to deliver earthquake aid, of course, just one day after a 7.6 magnitude earthquake hit the west coast of Japan. Uh, to give you some more details, uh, a Japanese airline spokesperson says the aircraft in flames there, as we can see extensive damage right into the interior of that aircraft, is Flight 516. It was flying from Shin Chitose Airport on Hokkaido Island to Haneda. And Japan Airlines says all on board managed to escape without life-threatening injury, including uh, eight children and we can see extensive damage there firefighters of course continuing to try to extinguish the flames we had live earlier the entire rear portion of the aircraft collapsed uh, onto the runway we have also seen social media footage from inside the plane showing orange flames from inside the plane window there we go there out of the left portion of the aircraft uh, and the smoke inside the cabin as well as it's come out of the runway we've now also hearing some testimony from uh, passengers one passenger said I felt a boom like we had hit something and jerked upward the moment we landed this was a passenger on the JAL flight, which told Kyoto News Agency, I saw sparks outside the window and smoke filled with, and the cabin, excuse me, filled with gas and smoke. But live pictures there now, you can see water cannons being used there to extinguish uh, the flames that are left of this aircraft. Uh, Amelia, thank you for that uh, summary. Well, with us still to discuss all of this is uh, Alistair Rosenshine. He's a former British Airways pilot, and Tim Atkinson, a, a former pilot and uh, air traffic investigator. Tim, I just want to come to you on that uh, latest bit of news that, that uh, Amelia just brought us, the, the Coast Guard plane, uh, where we'd known for some time that the captain had managed to escape, um, that the five other of the six crew members uh, had been accounted for, condition unknown, but according to the state broadcaster NHK, uh, those other five crew members uh, are now uh, expected to have uh, died. Uh, we've talked a lot in the last couple of hours about how remarkable it was that all 379 on board the Japan Airlines uh, flight were evacuated. Is it unsurprising that there are casualties on the Coast Guard plane? Uh, I, I think it's more surprising that one of them survived. Um, it, in a collision involving one very fast moving uh, and, and very massive uh, heavy object uh, and one uh, stationary or nearly stationary and much lighter object, the, the lighter one comes off much worse. Uh, and it's remarkable to me that the, the um, commander reportedly of, of the Coast Guard aircraft did survive. Um, it, it's it completely unremarkable that the others on board didn't quite how they perished and, and at what moment uh, is, of course, you know, something that the investigators will look at. But I, I, I don't think it's, it's going to surprise anyone uh, familiar with um, collision investigation, uh, that, that that is the outcome for them. The dynamic of the collision, you know, the precise manner in which the two aircraft uh, came into collision, which bits of them struck which other bits. I've mentioned the um, marks across the uh, leading edge of the nacelle of the, the left hand, the number one engine on the A350, coincident with the height of the Dash 8 wing. Uh, there are some images I've seen now of the nose of the A350, which tell a, a more perplexing story. Uh, there's clearly been some kind of collision there, but it, it's not immediately apparent just what. Um, the, the A350 uh, moving at the speed that we see in the images here, striking the Dash 8 um, more or less stationary, would have imparted a very sudden, uh, very severe, uh, very dramatic acceleration to it. Um, uh, uh, causing that the structural failure which leads to the release of fuel that we see then um, ignites and, and turns into that fireball um, uh, and uh, in in the circumstances as I say it, it, it's it's really remarkable that there was a survivor in fact. Alistair cl clearly um, this is a great tragedy with with five human lives lost we have been discussing throughout though how it could have been so much greater of a tragedy given that, uh, of course, 379 uh, on the Japan Airlines flight and one on the Coast Guard flight um, have, have uh, survived. W when there is a tragedy, um, how, how much does it affect the mindset of, uh, well, both passengers, but also, in your experience, pilots and, and cabin crew um, and, and the job that they do and, and the risks that they do face? 
Well, the risk is, is fairly low, but it is also very real. And, um, you know, pilots and uh, pilots train every six months in the simulator. Um, they cover all various accidents that you could have or potential accidents. Um, they train on evacuations. The cabin crew, of course, train on evacuation. They, they do so on an annual basis. And um, so, you know, every single takeoff and every single landing, uh, pilots are thinking in their head what could go wrong what, and how will they react if something happens. Um, you are constantly looking to see of any problems that may be arising. Now, had this accident happened during takeoff, we'd be looking at a completely different scenario. It would have been, uh, you know, far, far more, more dangerous. Um, on the landing roll, as it happened here, uh, the flight crew's main job there was to keep the aircraft straight and to bring it to halt as quickly as possible, shut down the aircraft and, and start the evacuation, also depressurize the aircraft, which is uh, very important to make sure that the aircraft's fully depressurized, because if it isn't, it's very difficult to open the doors, if not impossible. So um, it, it, it sounds to me like the crew did the, you know, operated the aircraft in the correct way and carried out the evacuation properly. I'm very sad to hear about what's happened to the um, to the crew on the other aircraft, on the smaller aircraft. Um, and uh, as the other speaker said, not at all surprised uh, that they uh, lost their lives in this accident. Um, watching the video, it is uh, quite, um, you know, it, it is a very large impact uh, with an immediate fire. It, it, you know, um, Anita Airport has, uh, you know, on, on some of the runways, there are crossing points where aircraft taxi across the runway. One always has to be incredibly careful as a pilot to make sure that one doesn't enter a runway in error or move too far forward on a taxiway so one's too close to a landing or a takeoff runway. It is something that um, all crew uh, train at. They make sure that they don't make these errors. But, you know, it is possible that one can make an error, especially at night when it's very difficult. Uh, no, not very difficult. It's just much more complicated. Uh, the lighting system on these big airports like Haneda, the lights are very, very bright. There are many of them. It is quite complex, and it, and it requires concentration of a vi very high level to make sure one doesn't manoeuvre one's aircraft into the wrong place at the wrong time. It's interesting, Alistair, hearing you say that. I mean, is it therefore a norm that... Uh... When you were a pilot, you were given the same routes and, and the, a big part of your job was knowing the procedures of the airports that you're flying between. Yes, you always study the airport layout before you uh, do any departure or any arrival. Of course, you're operating uh, at an airport, which you know well. Like, for example, I was based at Heathrow Airport, and, of course, I knew all the taxiways and the, and the runways, the layout very well at Heathrow. But when you go to... Uh, another airport, um, one which you don't operate in uh, very frequently. And, of course, it's much more complicated. You have to look at the, uh, study the charts very carefully and keep oneself orientated, not be distracted, and listen very carefully to not just the commands you're given from air traffic control or the ground controller as to where to taxi, but also listen to the, um, the instructions that are given to other aircraft, to landing aircraft, to other taxiing aircraft, to see that there's no, to hear that there's no conflict. So it is, whilst it's not, um, you know, impossible to do uh, probably it's very easy to make a, an error uh, to, to, to have an accident. So one's constantly having to, you know, concentrate really hardly, uh, hard and, uh, and not be distracted by anything. Um, I, I just wanted to go a bit further, Alistair, on, on, on the kind of what would have gone through the pilot's mind. I mean, we've, we've spoken quite a lot about the fact that the collision didn't immediately cause the fire in the A350 in the Japan Airlines uh, flight to be internal and that the remarkable images, which perhaps we can replay of that initial collision, um, do show a lot of flames immediately, but, but likely on the outside, not, not anything internal. But... Even on the outside, I mean, we've seen the image from which we're looking at now, the passengers, they, they get a glimpse of the fire, but in the cockpit, the fire, even if it was external, must have been, uh, I mean, absolutely front and center. W would that not have been a terrifying experience for the pilot? T talk us through the need to uh, maintain calmness, to be able to put into place your training, despite something like that right, right in your face. Well, those are very good points you raise. Um, 
the calmness attitude. So everybody reacts differently. Um, the more you're trained, the uh, better you're going to handle these situations. Uh, fear, everybody suffers from fear. Everybody is aware of fear. And in fact, fear is not a bad thing because it also, um, you know, it spurs one on to do the right thing. Um, I would say that uh, the initial impact would have been one of, uh, you know, pretty much horror on, on the flight deck. But they're in charge of controlling this aircraft, of keeping it straight. They, you know, that is your priority. Um, and you've got to try and overcome the fear factor. And you have to allow your training to kick in. And I have to say that having had numerous incidents over my own work career, um, you, whilst you are nervous, you keep saying to yourself, do, you know, control this aircraft, do the right thing, call out for uh, whatever emergency checklist is required and do it thoroughly. Don't cut corners, you know, just try and push those uh, feelings of, of, of fear aside. And, uh, you know, it can be uh, nerve wracking from time to time. And in an accident like this, uh, the fear level would have been very high. But let me just point another thing here. But um, you talked about the fire uh, ball of flames, etc. The flight crew can't see this. They will probably see a reflection. They would have heard the, the, the bang. They would have felt the jolt. But they're not going to know what's happening behind them because there are no cameras on these aircraft to show you what, you what you're seeing. There has been talk in the past of having a camera on the tail of the aircraft so the pilots can see what's happening around the aircraft. And I think, you know, it would be very nice to have those cameras, but when, in the absence of them in this case. And so they'll bring the aircraft to a halt, shut down uh, the engines and start the evacuation if the cabin crew haven't already done so because they are the cabin crew are trained to evacuate uh, before even without instructions once the aircraft comes to a halt if in their uh, opinion it is catastrophic. Um, uh, Tim Atkinson, uh, former pilot and air traffic uh, investigator, is still with us. Tim, we've spoken a number of times about some of the luck involved that uh, things could have gone a slightly, slightly different way. Um, Alistair was referencing there the fact that, thankfully, the plane, the Japan Airlines plane, was, was landing, not taking off. I mean, if the roles were reversed, would, would, uh, would this have been a very different outcome? Um, it's, it's an interesting hypothetical question. Um, you tend to see uh, different interactions on runways towards the high speed end of, the, of a departure runway. Uh, collisions of this kind are, 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 I would dare say, off the top of my head, statistically very much less likely. Um, the speeds involved um, during takeoff and landing, during the, the latter part of takeoff and the early part of landing, are, are very similar. Um, of course, volumes of fuel on board uh, a departing aircraft very much greater than uh, an arriving one, although what we're seeing here is, is mostly concerned with the fuel on the Dash 8 aircraft, I think, uh, rather than the A350. Um, the one one could hypothesize lots of lots of different things yeah. um you know what what if it was a, a a vehicle not a not an aircraft that was struck uh what if it was a larger aircraft and so forth uh, i think it, there are interesting mind games to play if you're an aviation safety person you know if you're an aircraft commander who thinks his way through through the day ahead uh, as one of those ways of of um managing um, uh, the, the, the threat environment as, 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 as pilots talk about it. Um, but it, in, in this case, uh, you know, uh, I think accident investigation, incident investigation is, is best done with a, with a, a sharp and small blade. Um, uh, and uh, although it can be um, beneficial to, to think about the wider piece, um, uh, it, it would be, unusual i think to be looking at a, a an event like this involving a a, a, a taking a, an aircraft taking off and and a departing aircraft colliding on a runway in these kinds of situations um alistair you spoke about what needed to happen to uh, put the cabin crew in a position to begin the evacuation and to open the doors this, this might sound like a sort of basic or silly question but but when we've been on planes we've all heard that rhetoric, doors to manual, doors to automatic. How important is that? And, and just talk us through why that happens and how it may or may not have come into play today. Well, the aircraft um, doors are left in uh, an automatic position uh, until such time as uh, normal disembarkation is uh, about to happen. And the reason for that is that 
if the doors are opened when uh, they're set in an automatic position, the slides will deploy, uh, allowing a, an evacuation to take part. But once, when you, after clearing the runway and heading back towards the, um, uh, the parking area, at some point you want to move the doors from their automatic position to manual because you don't want the slide deploying when the door is opened uh, on the stand. If you do, if you do do that, uh, people's lives are at risk because these these slides are, absolutely, you know, they're 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 fierce when they come out. Um, so that is uh, that is what the talk about when passengers hear uh, doors to manual and um, uh, that that call is to say that uh, at this point uh, you have to move it to manual before the doors are opened in the normal way. But uh, here in the evacuation, you see, it's not always the just the cabin crew who might be opening a door. Um, you don't, you know, there can be all sorts of scenarios in an in an aircraft accident, and it might be the case that a passenger has to open the door because there's no cabin crew available to do so. And um, in that case, if the door is already in the automatic way, then uh, the slide will deploy and the passengers will be able to disembark. It is vital, I mean, it really is vital that passengers study the uh, uh, emergency card that they have in the seat, seat uh, pocket in front of them and that they listen to the, um, to, to the uh, cabin, uh, uh, you know, the, the cabin crew will give instructions on what to do in emergencies and before every takeoff. Um, and I notice that most passengers who are frequent flyers, most people are frequent flyers now, they don't watch they don't listen they don't pay attention every aircraft is different um slightly different um where the location of the exits are very important it's very important that, that everybody takes it seriously because you know the passengers as well as the crew are involved in the safety of the aircraft it is a combined thing everybody working together to keep the the, the flight safe so you know once again i just say to everybody who's listening when you do fly do pay attention to the cabin crew um, instructions right at the beginning of the flight and study that card, know where your exits are. Tim, another question that comes to mind for, for me is the extent to which physically those on board the Japan Airlines flight would have felt the collision uh, or given the size mismatch, would it have been uh, you know, somewhat of a, a sort of ploughing through of the, 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 the smaller aircraft? That, that have been uh, a momentary uh, deceleration, but relatively minor. Uh, there might have been some um, yawing, uh, that's to say, you know, turning motion associated with that as well, depending on how the how the two aircraft came together uh, precisely. There have been some noise um, very clearly, uh, but it, no, I mean, it, we can see that there's no dramatic sudden deceleration of the aircraft at, at the moment of impact, and nor should there be. In, you know the, the physics of, of collisions are, are uh, you know straightforward Newtonian physics, very very um, very easy to understand, and a, a very heavy, massive thing like a, an A350 colliding with a, a, a state at speed colliding with a uh, a relatively much smaller thing such as a Dash 8. Um, yeah, they, they'd have been aware of it, but it, it wouldn't have been tre tremendously dramatic. Um, Alistair, is, is that similarly to, to your reading? I mean, again, we can see that from the pictures. We understand the physics, and, and uh, Tim's kind of made that point f fairly clearly. But uh, is the experience that actually slightly different when you're in the front of the plane and, and something like that might happen? Uh, well, first of all, I have to agree with everything Tim said there. Um, look, you know, as I said earlier, that the flight crew can't see what's happening behind them. So they have... They have uh, different ways of knowing what's happened. In this case, they probably would have heard the bang, they would have heard the jolt, they might have felt a yawing motion that's where the aircraft is, is turning slightly, in this case, would most probably have been towards the left. Um, and so they're trying to control the aircraft um, and you use, on, on landing, you use uh, the uh, rudder to control the aircraft at that point and whilst they still got some airspeed. Um, you know, you, you try and use all the clues you have. But the main thing is to keep control of the aircraft. And that's the pilot's job, is to keep to be in charge of that aircraft and make sure the aircraft does what you want it to do. In this case, stay on the runway, bring the aircraft to a halt, and then start the uh, evacuation. And, and that's what the flight crew will have been charged with doing. 
I want to bring back in Amelia Harper, Sky News correspondent, with me here on set. Uh, just, just to give us uh, a, a summary, Amelia, as we approach the top of the hour again, of, of all that we have uh, learnt in the last couple of hours. Well, shocking scenes coming from Tokyo's Haneda Airport. For those who have just joined us, the plane that we see on screen on the right and on the left there is Japanese airline flight uh, uh, A350 that landed at Haneda Airport. And the reason it is heavily on fire is because it collided with a smaller Japan Coast Guard plane, flight MA722, a Bombardier Dash 8, while landing. All 379 passengers and crew on board that Japan airline A350 that we see on screen have been safely evacuated, but public broadcaster NHK is now reporting that five out of the six crew on board the smaller Coast Guard, Coast Guard plane have now died. We didn't initially know their condition, but NHK now reporting they have died. The captain of the Coast Guard plane did, though, manage to escape, and this was a plane that was on... Its its way to Nagata Airport to deliver earthquake aid. This is just a day after a huge earthquake hit the west coast of Japan. As we can see on screen there, uh, this plane engulfed in flames coming out of the windows there. Firefighters still trying to put out the blaze. More details about this plane on screen. Uh, a Japan Airlines spokesperson says that Flight 516 departed from Shin Chitose Airport on Hokkaido Island, flying to Haneda. And Japan Airlines says that all on board managed to escape without life-threatening injury, including uh, eight children. But as we have got on the screen there, social media footage from inside the plane shows it travelling down the runway, having burst into flames. We can also see smoke uh, coming from inside of the cabin. Passengers describe the cabin filling with smoke. We can see bumpy turbulence there. One told Kyoto News Agency, I felt a boom like we'd hit something and jerked upwards. The moment we landed, they also said, I saw sparks outside the window and the cabin was filled with gas and smoke. But at the moment, as you can see, there are a huge emergency response at the airport. Live pictures just there uh, showing even the insides of the aircraft and the fuselage hanging off parts of, of the rest of the aircraft there. All runway at this airport have now been closed and flights have been suspended. Well, as Amelia said there, uh, all 379 passengers on the Japan Airlines uh, flight were successfully ev evacuated. Five, though, of the six on the Coast Guard flight, sadly, uh, have passed away, according to the state broadcaster. More of this ongoing coverage uh, after this short break.
that a Japan Airlines plane has caught fire on the runway at Tokyo's Haneda Airport after colliding with a Japanese Coast Guard plane. All 379 passengers and crew of the Japan Airlines flight were safely evacuated. The pilot of the Coast Guard plane has also escaped, but the other five crew members on board that aircraft are now reported to have died. It uh, was on its way to deliver aid to people caught up in the powerful earthquakes that struck Japan yesterday. Uh, here are some other key points that we know so far. <clears throat> Excuse me. The Japan Airlines flight JAL 516 left New Shitozi Airport on the northern island of Hokkaido for Tokyo at quarter past four local time. <clears throat> Excuse me. It landed at Haneda Airport on the outskirts of Tokyo just after a quarter to six, uh, a flight time of one hour 32 minutes. Cameras caught the moment that the plane burst into flames as it landed. And this footage, filmed from inside the plane by a passenger, also shows the moment of landing and flames quite visible there outside the left-hand window. Let's bring in Sky's uh, Amelia Harper, who's uh, here with me on set. And Amelia, just remind uh, those viewers that are joining us uh, right now what we've been uh, witnessing over the last few hours. That's right. Well, the plane that we can see right now, those live pictures, is a Japan airline plane that landed on the runway at Tokyo's Haneda Airport. And as you can see, it's heavily on fire. And the reason that is the case is because it collided with a smaller Japan Coast Guard plane. This is flight... MA722, a Bombardier Dash 8, this is a much smaller plane, whilst it landed. Now, this plane that we see on screen, all 397 plus passengers and crew on board have been safely evacuated. But very sadly, state broadcaster NHK is now reporting five of the six crew on board the smaller Coast Guard plane have died. The captain of this plane did manage to escape, but we are yet uh, to find out his condition. And this was a plane that was on its way to Nagata Airport to deliver aid just one day after a 7.6 magnitude earthquake hit the west coast uh, of Japan. And as we can see on screen, we've got that burning wreckage there, smoke rising. Uh, we there on the right have footage of that plane having landed at the airport burst into flames as it landed uh, on the runway. More details about this plane that we can see on the right and the left. Uh, this is flight 516 that departed from Shin Chitozi Airport on Hokkaido Island, uh, flying to Haneda. All on board managed to escape without life-threatening injury. It's amazing looking at that picture that we've got there. We can really see the inside uh, even as well, uh, including eight children. And we have, as you said, CCTV footage uh, of that plane travelling down, having burst into flames. To corroborate this, we also have footage from inside of the plane showing orange flames from inside the plane window and smoke inside the cabin. There we go, outside the left window, inside the cabin there. Passengers describe it filling with smoke. All runways at this airport have now been closed. Flights have been suspended. But this is a, a hugely uh, intense situation for, for emergency services. They're a hugely flammable situation. They've been fighting for hours now to try to diminish. Um, let's bring in some of our, our guests uh, who are able to add further expertise and perspective for us. Alistair Rosenstein, an aviation expert and former British Airways 747 pilot, uh, is with us. So too is Tim Atkinson, air traffic investigator and former pilot. Um, I want to come first of all to you, Alistair, because uh, we might have touched this topic again, but for, for viewers that are just joining us, talk us through the remarkable fact that uh, all 379 on board the Japan Airlines flight uh, were able to, to be evacuated uh, and, and to survive what looks on the surface, whether it's the pictures of the immediate impact or the pictures we're looking at now, to be quite a, a full-scale disaster for this uh, Airbus uh, A350 Japan Airlines flight? Right. Well, the first thing to say is that uh, although the, the videos show what looks like a catastrophic accident, in fact, the aircraft looks like it was more or less intact or mostly intact when it came to a halt on the runway. So that then means that uh, the, there's, no, the disor there's no disorientation factor within the cabin and the passengers are able to move towards the exits where the cabin crew will be calling them to to uh, evacuate. 
Um, and so that, that uh, works in favour of the aircraft. And what we see in these videos, um, the videos that you've been showing all morning, is the aircraft slowly disintegrating. But the passengers were off the aircraft a long time before the fire uh, took hold inside the cabin. At least that's the word, what I understand from the videos that we've been seeing and from what we've been hearing. Um, and so that will account for why they all managed to get off successfully. And also, as I said earlier, um, that culturally... Uh, the Japanese are very orderly people, and they follow instructions properly. And, uh, and I suspect that they will therefore have, you know, evacuated this aircraft in, in probably as close to a perfect uh, scenario as possible. On that, so, on that note, know, uh, Alistair, forgive me for interrupting, we have new pictures uh, of the passengers uh, leaving the aircraft, uh, at least immediately uh, as they were getting off it and Tim Atkinson is still with us uh, who's a former pilot and an air traffic investigator and, and Tim uh, your take on this imagery that we're seeing uh, of, of the passengers getting off it I, I mean it's interesting how many are on the slide at once it's interesting the the state of the plane as they as they are evacuating well the thing that strikes me most immediately is that it, it looks as if there's some kind of efflux from the number two engine there by, by which I'm, I'm saying that it looks as if the engine may even still be running. Um, uh, or, 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 or are we seeing some other reason why, that, why there is that um, uh, smoke and flames coming out of the back of that engine? It's, it's, it's not extraordinary um, for an engine to be left running unintentionally or indeed for a crew to wish to shut an engine down and the systems don't enable them to. You know, the disruption that's occurred to the underside of this A350 here to its systems... Clearly, the nose landing gears collapse. That usually takes out some structure. There's an awful lot of electronics, a lot of computing, a lot of wiring um, uh, under the floor of an aircraft. Uh, but it, it appears to me there that, that there are interesting questions about what that engine is doing. Uh, yeah, there are people flowing down the slides pretty well. There are some people assisting at the bottom of the slides. That's, that's good behaviour as well. Uh, those slides are at a ver very shallow angle. That is impeding the speed of people down those slides. Slides are set up for an ideal angle at which people should slide down them at a rate that aids evacuation. We can see that that is the only slide operating on the number two or, or the right-hand side of that aircraft. That's interesting as well. But equally, looking at what's going on further back, it's absolutely correct that that should be the only slide in use. Um, so, Tim, Tim just, I, just go, go into more detail for us your surprise that that you said e-flux, what is that? And uh, that, that you're seeing some kind of activity around that, that engine. Why is that such a, a surprise to you? That, that engine should be sitting there inert. No, nothing should be coming out of the back of it. Um, we can see a, a range of things going on underneath the, the centre section of the wing there. But I, I'm seeing sparks um, coming out of the back of that engine in that imagery. I think I'm perceiving some rotation of the, the fan spinner so the front of the engine, so it looks to me as if that engine may indeed still be running. Um, reasons for that, uh, it, one, potentially it hasn't been shut down um, by the crew, you know, the crew haven't attempted to shut it down. Two, um, the crew have attempted to shut down, but it hasn't responded to commands to shut it down, i.e., you know, they, they've done the actions to close the fuel valve, but the, um, the path uh, of, of electrical and electronic items that enables the closure of the fuel valve and or the fuel valve itself um, ha have not operated as, as they should. Um, but that, that is very interesting to me. Uh, I'll be interested to see imagery from the other side of the aircraft. We can also see what appears to be some liquid coming out of the underside of the, 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 the centre section there. Um, fuel, water, who knows, something's been breached, there's something leaking out of there. Um, but focusing again on the evacuation, uh, it makes it all the more remarkable that everyone's off this aircraft in one piece, um, given that it appears uh, we've only got two slides at the front, and I think uh, there was video earlier showing that the rear slide on the left-hand side of the aircraft uh, was also operating. And I'll also, you, you know, just draw attention. And a lot of people don't like hypothesis, and they don't like, you know, informed discussion after a crash. Um, I, I'm in favour of it where it is informed and it's expert, because if it isn't informed and expert, then it's, it's hypothesis and conjecture by people who don't know what they're talking about. But I will draw attention to the uh, nacelle of the number two engine there. And again, we've got those um, marks 
at that disruption of the nacelle structure, uh, more serious on the inboard side than on the outboard side, which appears to be coincident with the height off the ground of a Dash 8 wing, um, and again is, is indicative of, of the dynamic of the collision, also of interest, and the, the, the camera angle keeps shifting. But when we see the nose of the aircraft, the, uh, the ray dome, the nose cone, the very front of the aircraft, there has clearly been uh, badly disrupted. Other imagery shows that the area just underneath it is also badly disrupted. That will also be um, very useful information for investigators. They will be using this video evidence, I'm sure, uh, and analysing it as I'm analysing it now, uh, although with the benefit of a lot more time and, and a lot, lot more other evidence um, to work out the collision dynamic. And I'll, I'll mention as well, uh, uh, you've asked other correspondents about the process of keeping control of the aircraft. When we see disruption, uh, like we see here to the radome, the nose comb, uh, to the um, nose landing gear assembly, its structure and its mountings, often that means that there's damage to the flight deck floor. Uh, and and there have been cases in the past where pilots have been in the seat with their feet trapped in the mechanism of the rudder pedals, and the underside of the instrument panel. Uh, that causes control difficulties. It causes them to be unable to, to evacuate, um, or, or it leaves them with you know, leg and ankle and, and foot injuries, which make evacuation very difficult. Um, those are other areas that will be interesting to, to explore for the investigators in this case. Although, again, as I emphasize, you know, it, it's not a question, did the aircraft perform as it should have done, because aircraft are not designed and built to withstand this kind of thing. When they do withstand it, and they withstand it as well as this one has here, that is very good news. Um, I want to bring back in uh, Alistair Rosenstein, who's uh, an aviation expert, former uh, pilot for a, a Boeing 747, a similar size aircraft. Um, Alistair, just, just reflect on what we've been watching and, and what Tim was saying in terms of his surprise that that engine on the right-hand side still seemed to have some kind of activity around it. What would have been going through the pilot and the crew's mind? Is the procedure or, or, or more uh, dictate that you don't allow people to evacuate in front of a, an engine that's still going? Did they decide to overrule that because of the gravity of the situation? What might have been going through the, the pilots and their colleagues' minds at that moment? Well, if the, if the flight crew knows that an engine's still running, they don't want to evacuate passengers behind the, um, behind the engine, um, and they also want to um, let the cabin crew know uh, that one of the engines may still be, still be running, um, so that they can instruct the passengers to go down the uh, slide and to, uh, and therefore, in this case, um, to turn towards the front of the aircraft, not towards the back of the aircraft. I'm not sure whether that engine is still turning. There's, there's quite a strong wind, and uh, the sparks seem to be flying backwards. It, it may be running. It may not, but uh, it, it's always difficult to tell. But in this video, you can also see just about make out that there are passengers leaving from the back of the aircraft on the left-hand side of the aircraft. Um, so it's possible they were using three slides to come down. All, all this will become much clearer um, uh, for the accident investigators. They will follow. These, the videos we're looking at, they are going to be used on training videos for air, air crew and cabin crew around the world in the future because... You know, there's a lot to be learned from this and mm. the way that the passengers are uh, managing to evacuate. And also, as it was mentioned, the reduced angle of these slides, uh, meaning that passengers are sliding down much more slowly. In, in fact, uh, the slower you go down, uh, it reduces uh, the possibility of injuries when you come off the bottom end. Uh, a lot of elderly passengers, when they reach the bottom of the slide, can pitch forward onto um, the, uh, what we call it tarmac, it's actually concrete and uh, that can cause injuries. So, you know, th this will be analysed in a great deal of uh, detail. What we, you know, once again, i just say how fortunate it is that they all managed to get off and that the systems and the training that the uh, crew received and the passengers following instructions have all worked out, seem to have worked out very well indeed. Well, on that note, Alistair, I mean, I think in the last hour of coverage, we were coming up with the terms that it was, it was a remarkable that everyone got off uh, from this plane um, safely, but not a miracle. I, I just wonder from this imagery whether you revise that framing of things when you, you look at the scale of, of damage to this larger of the two planes, whether it's a hole in the side of that engine 
the fact that there's smoke still coming out the back, sparks flying and, and liquid dripping, I mean, it, it, does, it does seem miraculous to me, but you, you guys are the experts. Um, look, you know, it, every accent is different. They're all individual accents. But there, is some, some, there are some basic things that happen in, um, in an accent like this where the aircraft's on the ground. And uh, the training that the crew will have received will conform with the way we see in this, in this video. Um, it is, you know, an, an aircraft has um, a certain structure of a certain exit, and uh, there, are any, there are only certain ways in which you can disembark an aircraft in a hurry. And this seems to be working out very well indeed uh, from what I can see. It, it, there doesn't seem to be um, too much panic. Uh, passengers are, when they get to the bottom of the slide, they seem to be moving away from it. Um, it, it, it looks remarkable because this, this aircraft has received quite a lot of damage. You can see damage to, we can see both engines, the nose of the aircraft. In fact, the aircraft has managed to stay on the runway. It's, it's important that the aircraft does stay on the runway, and that is because the emergency vehicles uh, can only really get to an aircraft if it's still on the hard standing, on the concrete surface. Um, so they've done that. The other thing that um, uh, hasn't really been mentioned, but we can see from here that the wind is actually down the runway. So flight crew are instructed that when there is a fire, uh, you turn in such a way that the fire will blow away from the aircraft. That's not obviously the case here. I doubt that they had much control at all. Uh, with the aircraft, but the, uh, they're fortunate in the wind is actually going more or less straight down the runway, as we can see from the, from the smoke here. So the smoke is not impeding the evacuation. F fascinating extra context. Um, d Tim, uh, I, I guess we've covered this a little bit before, but again, in light of these most recent pictures, is it remarkable that this plane didn't become a fireball instantaneously or explode? I mean, is that a silly question? Uh... Well, I, I believe there's no such thing as a silly question, um, but uh, uh, no, it, it isn't. You know, you've, you've got to have combustible materials, uh, you've got to have a, a source of ignition, and you've got to have a, a, a ready supply of oxygen. Yeah, there's oxygen in the atmosphere. Yes, there are combustible materials, but they, they, they require much higher temperatures than, than is present here. Um, no, it, it, I, I'll be interested to see how much of the burning material that we watched in the video is actually uh, related to the Dash 8. Um, and how much is, is A350. Uh, the images, I think, are showing the A350 is relatively intact. Um, the, 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 there is certainly something going on with the number two engine. We can see a lot of stuff coming out very rapidly uh, from that engine. I think the wind is actually quite light here. We can see a bit of firefighting media um, being, being blown around the place. But no, it, it's, it, it, it's, it's not in such a bad state. And, and um, uh, I think, you know, what happens next is that that fire takes hold and, and leads to the images that we were watching earlier on. It might be just useful to recap what um, survivability comes from. Uh, and, uh, and there's a, a well-known Scandinavian car manufacturer who are notorious for this. You survive an event like this first if the G-forces you're exposed to are within human tolerance. You know, if, if you hit something hard enough, fast enough, um, it, your, your internal organs simply uh, cease to be as they should. So were the G-forces for these people within human tolerance? Yes, very, very easily. Um, are you in a volume which is not injuriously penetrated? Yes, you are. You're sitting in an aircraft fuselage. There's some damage going on around you, but, but the, the volume you're in has not been injuriously penetrated. Are you suitably restrained in that volume? Yes, the passengers are in their seats with their seat belts on. Um, is the environment in that volume survivable? Is it full of water so you drown, or is there not enough air to breathe? Uh, no, there's clearly enough air to breathe, and, and it's, it's not gone into water. Then are you able to use your senses to orientate in the environment and manoeuvre in the environment to get out? And yes, clearly you can. Um, those are the, the fundamentals, whether you're in a, a train, a boat, uh, a, an aircraft or a car, which lead to surviving an event like this. And, um, uh, and I, I suspect, you know, that we will see uh, passengers' um, accounts of this as, as being less dramatic than it appears 
with the hindsight of watching the aircraft burn to, to a pile of ashes. Well, I guess that remains to be seen. And uh, either way, it's very, very helpful context. So, so thank you, Tim, for that. Uh, stick with us, Tim and Anastasia. I'm going to bring in now Michelle Robson, who's uh, a former air traffic controller. Michelle, thanks for joining us. Do, do, do you feel, uh, as you look at this, that there may have been an air traffic control failure? Um, it looks like at the moment, obviously, there needs to be a proper investigation, but it looks like it could actually be down to a runway incursion with perhaps the, um, the Coast Guard aircraft entering the runway when it shouldn't. I think um, there's some important factors here in that it's dark, so there's less visibility from the tower. They do have all the um, safety equipment that you'd expect at a major airport, so they have a runway incursion um, alerting system but it wouldn't probably have set off here because there's nothing actually on the runway when it entered. Um, and they have surface movement radar, which would normally be the first line of defence. However, it does look like the Coast Guard aircraft did not have a transponder or ADSB, which actually gives the label on the controller's display. So that's another element that perhaps the controller might not have seen straight away if it was a pilot error. Um, so it looks like, that, as usual, there's a lot of factors involved in this incident. That, that's really interesting. Explore that for me a bit more are you suggesting that perhaps because this airport doesn't typically take Coast Guard planes, perhaps, and obviously, as we know, this Coast Guard plane was due to take aid to, to an earthquake disaster zone, um, that, that it's not logged or tracked in the same way that passenger aircraft are? Well, normally, you would expect a major airport uh, as busy as this for all the aircraft to have either ADSB or a transponder or both, because that's normally required for passenger aircraft. So the fact that this uh, doesn't appear to have had those things would have made it less visible uh, if the aircraft didn't do what you expected. Obviously, they still have a view from the tower uh, and the aircraft have lights at night. But if you think of the split second timing of this, it wouldn't have taken more than a few seconds for the aircraft potentially to get on the runway as the other aircraft was landing. Um, and at that point, obviously, uh, with a large passenger jet, it probably wouldn't have seen the smaller aircraft in the dark. Um, so, as I said, a lot of factors that could have led to this. We're still waiting for more confirmation, but it does look like this probably could be a runway incursion, which is one of the, the um, most dangerous factors uh, in terms of uh, airport incidents. Um, to talk to me about... You, you, you suggested there that this airport uh, has all the right... typically has all the right uh, equipment and procedures in place. What, what do you know of this airport and... Uh, typically uh, how efficient and safe and, uh, and high quality it is? Well, it's, it was operating in what we would call a mixed mode for the two runways that were in use, which um, for people in the UK you're not used to because at Heathrow they typically uh, have one runway that's just for departures and one for um, arrivals, which obviously is generally a bit safer. Um, however, a lot of airports do operate in mixed modes. It's quite often more efficient. Um, and it, generally, there's a very good safety record. Um, these sort of incidents happen very rarely now since the, I'm sure most people remember the one in Tenerife, uh, which is a similar one in Fog, where two aircraft collided on the ground. And this is when they brought in things like the surface movement radar that I mentioned. Um, and further, there's been um, these aircraft uh, incursion tools that uh, alert planes and uh, vehicles if they're entering a runway where there's something already there. Um, so typically these sort of things don't happen anymore, but it does sound like there, there are some unusual factors here with a, a small aircraft that w wouldn't typically operate from a major uh, international passenger um, airport. Um, and Michelle, whilst we've got you, I just wanted to explore what then has to kick into place. So as we understand it, uh, this airport, which is Tokyo, Japan's busiest airport, is, is fully shut down at the moment. The sort of traffic that it would have been expecting, how, how hard and complicated is it to redirect all of that traffic to, to other areas? Well, obviously, fortunately, they do have Narita, which is a large uh, major airport. But the main problem in these sort of cases is uh, more the actual space once they've landed. So uh, the things that were already in the air would have been uh, directed somewhere else because obviously it's been shut. Um, and they typically carry enough fuel for a diversion plus an extended holding. And there's a set minimum amount of fuel to allow for these sort of incidents. Um, however, once they land, of course, the airport is not expecting all those extra aircraft. So the chances are that they'll run out of stands quite quickly and then aircraft will have to divert further afield. But I would suspect there'll be a lot of cancellations today as well for things that are short haul into Haneda because they will simply run out of room in other, other airports like Narita. 
And, and, and if something similar happened with a, uh, the UK's biggest airport, which I guess is Heathrow, that's something that uh, air traffic control will be able to kick in and, and put into place fairly quickly? Obviously, it's something that we hope never happens. However, we do have things, for example, like with snow, where we end up with airports closed. So it's something that air traffic controllers are used to managing, uh, and there are procedures that are used where they keep track of how many slots there are at each uh, airport and stands, uh, and there's like a central coordination um, person that, that manages all that. So there are procedures in place for it. Obviously, uh, I don't know what they do in Tokyo, but I would assume it's something similar. So, yes, we can handle it. But, yes, it's hard work for the controllers and those trying to coordinate all the different airports to uh, handle that. Um, Tim Atkinson is still with us, uh, former pilot and an air traffic investigator. Tim, what's your take on what we've just been hearing from Michelle there about the possible uh, reason for, for the initial collision and, and, and different equipment being uh, in place on the Coast Guard plane compared to, to what is typical at a big uh, passenger airport like this? Well, it, it, it's quite a detailed bit of hypothesis, which, um, you know, if, if I were an investigator involved in this case, I, I would have at the back of my mind, but, but um, uh, I, I wouldn't be focusing on it. The uh, information crucial to a, an investigator's task is thinking one's way into the situations of those involved. So of the pilots of the two aircraft, of any other personnel on the ground who were involved, and of course, of the air traffic control um, personnel uh, who were involved, um, understanding what their perspectives are, what their expectations were, what their mental model of what should be happening was, and comparing that with reality. That, for example, is, is often a, a very highly informative part of the investigative process. And within that, you have the data that is available and presented to an individual and their uh, training and in and capacity to absorb that data and process it effectively. So a controller sitting uh, in a, a visual control room in the, the air traffic control tower um, will be uh, looking around at the environment, um, both with the naked eye and they'll, they'll have uh, binoculars available as well. Um, they have the data in front of them, um, which used to be paper strips and plastic holders. I would have no doubt at all that this airport has progressed, as almost all have, to electronic data. Um, and that data is manipulated in various ways which use the, uh, the haptic senses, our sense of touch and motion and, and our use of our musculoskeletal systems to reflect, for example, runway occupation. Uh, and I should mention, uh, perhaps I, I was an air traffic controller myself as well many years ago. Um, and those things are all ways in which a tower controller, an air controller, you know, the person looking after the runway and the immediate environment around the runway, may, builds and maintains uh, an accurate picture of what's going on. Now, an element here may be that that picture wasn't accurate and an inaccurate picture was acted upon. Or it may be that the picture wasn't accurate because of another factor, such as, for example, we see occasionally crew taxi into places where they shouldn't, and that includes taxiing onto runways that they shouldn't taxi onto. Um, and there are all kinds of safeguards and barriers uh, to those things happening. But none of those are reliable, and indeed, you, you can get into a, a safeguard or barrier fatigue situation, you know, where I'm sure we've all seen situations where there are so many people wearing high visibility vests and so many flashing lights of different colours that you've no idea at all what's going on around you. And that's the kind of thing I'm talking about here. Uh, and, and that's another factor which uh, the investigators, I'm sure in this case, uh, will be considering. Uh, I think it is much too early to, to be um, identifying uh, or, or nominating uh, specific things, uh, although, yes, you know, a lower technology aircraft uh, which doesn't have the same equipment on board it uh, and which doesn't present on a controller's um, display screen in the same way as the others, yeah, that, that's clearly something that's of interest to an investigator dealing with that aspect of this, this particular case in the future. Well, we're going to take a very quick uh, break here on Sky News. We'll have ongoing uh, coverage of this uh, situation at Tokyo's Haneda Airport, where 379 
uh, lives on board uh, the uh, Japan Airways Flight 516 were success successfully evacuated despite a collision with a Coast Guard plane uh, on landing at the airport, uh, where sadly five of six crew members uh, have passed away. Ongoing coverage uh, in just a few moments here on Sky News. Don't go anywhere.
flights headed towards uh, Niigata Airport to deliver earthquake aid just a day after a huge earthquake hit the west coast uh, of Japan. More details about the plane that we can see on the screen there. Extensive damage, uh, glowing orange with the fire there. This Japan Airlines flight 516 departed from Shin Shitozi Airport on Hokkaido Island, flying to Haneda. All on board did manage to escape. And if we look at the damage there, smoke rising from those windows burnt, burnt out there, uh, all on board managed to escape without life-threatening injury, including uh, eight children. And we have seen CCTV, as you said, showing that plane travelling down that runway, having burst into flames. More footage as well from inside the plane as well, once it had landed, showing smoke inside uh, the cabin. There we go, orange flames outside of that left side window, a turbulent landing, of course, for passengers. One told Kyoto News Agency, I felt a boom like we hit something and jerked upwards when we landed, and we can see there's smoke inside of that cabin. Uh, there are around 70 fire engines on the scene there at the moment. You can see that little white nozzle on the front. That's about to, to, to um, have some water come out of it to try to put out this, this blaze, but a hugely flammable situation here. Well, we've uh, got uh, a number of guests with us to further dissect what's uh, taking place this morning or this afternoon uh, at Japanese time. Uh, joining me uh, are the former uh, air traffic uh, controller, uh, Michelle Robson, uh, the former uh, pilot uh, and aviation expert, Alistair Rosenshine, and uh, the aviation expert, uh, John Strickland. Um, Michelle, I want to come back to you first uh, of all and to, to touch on what might have uh, unfolded to lead to this collision. And, and one point you were mentioning to us earlier is, according to some reports, the fact that this Coast Guard plane might not have been equipped with the same tracking devices that most commercial planes have at what is predominantly a commercial passenger airport? Well, certainly looking at the replay of uh, ADSB, which is a, a way of tracking aircraft that's quite new, um, can't actually see the other air, aircraft on the runway, the um, Coast Guard, so it might suggest it either had, didn't have it or it wasn't turned on. Um, but obviously, as I said, it's unusual to have a Coast Guard uh, aircraft at most major airports. Haneda obviously might be slightly different. I'm not an expert on Haneda. Um, but having a yeah, smaller aircraft that's perhaps not used to flying for big commercial airports like Haneda uh, could mean that perhaps it doesn't have all the uh, equipment that you'd expect or perhaps for some reason it was malfunctioning. But I said at the moment on the replay that I can see of ADSB, I can't actually see that aircraft uh, on the runway when the uh, Japan Air comes into the uh, land. Um, and Alistair Rosenstein, uh, aviation expert and former 747, Boeing 747 pilot, uh, also with us. Alistair, in, in that scenario uh, for the pilot of the, uh, the, the, the large Tokyo uh, Airways plane on approach, if you haven't been formally pre-warned by a system or an air traffic controller that, that there's something there, then there's, there's nothing you can do. Well, you're looking out of the window, of course, and you, you're always looking out of the window when you're coming into land. Um, to, to check that there is nothing in the way. Um, but at night, it's very difficult. The runway lights are very, very bright indeed. Um, so if there is an aircraft, and especially a smaller aircraft, which is moving onto the runway, uh, they're, they're almost invisible. I, I know they've got, uh, they will have, uh, you know, their navigation lights on, they should probably have a strobe light on as well. But the point is that that almost disappears in all the brighter lighting from the runway. So you can see how an accident like this would, would occur. But had the pilots have seen an aircraft um, too close to the runway or entering the runway, another aircraft, then, then of course, they would go around. Um, even if the controller hasn't said anything to them, they would make the decision to go around. Obviously, they never saw it. Um, well, and that's well, how this accident happened. I mean, when you say go around, again, just, just from me watching these clips, it, it looks like the plane probably would have touched down just before the collision as opposed to... To as it was touching down, but but how much warning would the the pilot of the Japan Airlines flight have needed to be able to divert it had it seen it or had it been warned? Are we talking about twenty seconds worth of warning? I mean, it's not it's not something that you can pivot on a on a dime. No, look, it's um, it, it's a very difficult question to answer, uh, uh, give you a straight answer to. But whilst you're still able to rotate the aircraft, fly full power and go up again, then you will do so, if you can do so without hitting the obstruction. Um, there comes a point where 
it's too late to, to try to even attempt to go around and uh, the collision will happen. If you've landed the aircraft, you've still got um, high speed. There is, you, you could... You could do a, a, a later go around, but there are there are all sorts of complications because if air brakes would have deployed, um, you would have already closed the throttles. You know there is there are complications with it, but and and there have been cases where pilots have tried to um, take off again to avoid a collision, uh, and unfortunately not made it, um, uh, and the two aircraft have collided and makes things even worse because in the uh, in in deciding to do a go around, you're applying more power. I mean we're, we're getting very complicated here. Uh, the fact is, on this case here that we're talking about today, uh, clearly that didn't happen. They collided, and then uh, all, you, all, the, all the flight crew of the Airbus can do is try and bring this aircraft to a halt and evacuate everybody. And M Michelle Robson, in your time as a, an air traffic controller, have you ever had any uh, near collisions or, or indeed collisions, uh, anything even comparable to this? No, as I said earlier, these are extremely rare and... Um when they had the Tenerife one, which was uh, one of the worst air disasters ever, they put in a lot of protocols to stop these sort of things happening. So, uh, fortunately, they are extremely rare. But um, as was said earlier, no, no system is completely infallible. It, it's uh, probably very likely there's a number of events that happen to cause this, not just one a single incident. Um, John Strickland is with us uh, as well now, an airline industry um, analyst. John, John, your assessment of... Uh, this airport, uh, this airline, their, their safety history and, and what's unfolded today? Well, Haneda is one of the two major airports uh, serving Tokyo uh, metropolitan area. It's very close to the city centre. It's therefore popular because of the ease of city access. The reach is a long way out of town, could be up to a two-hour journey to get there. So pretty well all the domestic flights, uh, of which this was one, operate in and out of Haneda. Uh, increasingly, international flights are using it too. Japan Airlines is an airline of uh, many, many decades of successful and safe operation, a well-regarded airline uh, throughout the world. And, of course, they were using a very state-of-the-art uh, modern aircraft in the form of a, an A350 uh, on this flight coming into Haneda today. Well, just on that, that point, you, you, you mentioned uh, that, that it uh, is used for domestic flights. This was a domestic flight from near the Sapporo area to, to Tokyo. I think the flight time was an hour 32. Are you surprised by the size of plane for, for, for such a short flight, or is, is that actually the norm in, in Japan? Yeah, that's, that's actually the norm. In the past, when um, Japan Airlines uh, and the other Japanese airline, or Nippon Airlines, flew the Boeing 747, that's the, uh, the jumbo aircraft, which I think uh, Anthony Rosen, Rosen China actually used to fly, it was an even larger aircraft. And, and Japan is known for having very large aircraft on domestic flights for some very, very high-volume routes, and uh, they tend to put in a very large number of seats, uh, a higher number than would be used on international flights because the demand is so strong, and these flights are running at a very high frequency, uh, often um, uh, hourly or even more frequent than that, linking uh, different domestic cities, and particularly domestic cities around Japan with Tokyo itself. Well, and, and on that note, 367 passengers and 12 crew on board this uh, Airbus A350 how, how does that compare to the norm and how does it inform your um, assessment of how successful they were on getting everyone off? But that's, uh, that again reflects uh, the domestic operation. Uh, 360 plus seats on this aircraft is, is relatively high for, for an Airbus A350 if, if one of these aircraft was being used on uh, an international flight where they probably have a first class business class and economy. You could have getting down towards 200, 250 seats more commonly. So this reflects this plane was uh, in what is called a high-density configuration. But equally to your point, uh, crew uh, are trained in emergency evacuation of aircraft. They're trained to do so when not all the exits are available, as would have been the case today. Uh, they would have seen fire, at least uh, looking out of some of the windows and knowing they couldn't use those exits. So to get uh, an extremely large number of people off so quickly and so successfully is really a testament to their training, obviously an exemplary performance. And if we also tie that in with the fact we've got video footage, as you're showing now, taken by passengers on board the plane, while on the one hand, there was confusion from the passengers. They wondered what was happening when that plane uh, had the collision as it, as it landed. Today, in the age of social media, people are taking pictures. There's many pictures around uh, these days of uh, evacuations of aircraft taken by passengers, when, in fact, the priority has to be 
getting the heck out of that aircraft as quickly as possible and any delay of filming or looking for baggage is an impediment to the cabin crew to successfully getting everyone off. So with those facts in mind, it's even more a testament to their skill. They managed to overcome those uh, obstacles in, in, in uh, handling uh, the evacuation of a plane so successfully. Um, Alistair, ju just to go back to that point, we've discussed it a lot, but, but the scale of uh, success in the job of cabin crew uh, to, to get uh, everyone off in time. Um, the, the fact that the plane was so full and so uh, densely populated, uh, as, as um, John was just explaining, uh, it, it is really very impressive, even if it wasn't, uh, I think everyone has decided it wasn't miraculous, but hugely remarkable, that, that this was a successful evacuation. Well, it was, and, and um, as I said earlier, because the aircraft was more or less still intact, at least the cabin was still intact, and uh, uh, the uh, the door, the frame of the aircraft obviously hadn't been distorted to the point at which they couldn't open the doors. So uh, they used the slides to, to get everyone out. One would expect them to be able to do so. Um, you know, it was, I have to say, there's a lot of a lot of luck, a lot of misfortune in the, in this accident, and misfortune in the accident happened in the first place but also fortunate that the aircraft was still in a relatively intact state so they could uh, carry out the evacuation in a normal way, which is what they did quite successfully. I, I think the, uh, the, the, the videos we've seen are a little bit um, difficult to see the whole aircraft, but uh, it, they definitely used two slides, possibly three slides. They may have used the uh, rear one on the left-hand side of the aircraft as well. But they got everybody off, um, and they all survived in the A350, and um, and that will be seen as a as a success. There's no question about it. As a successful evacuation of the aircraft. I mean, John, in your position as a, a broader industry analyst, what, what what sort of happens after these things? I mean, d does this damage the airline? Does it damage the manufacturer's uh, kind of image amongst consumers, or or is it in fact this particular example the chance of the opposite because of a successful evacuation because the plane didn't become a fireball instantaneously, despite there being a lot of fire around it? Well, each case, of course, is very different. It depends on the circumstances. You know, once uh, the safety report is, or additional safety report is issued and we find out you know, what the cause is, I mean, it's, it's clear here we had this collision, but in any accident situation, it, it, it depends on what caused the accident and whether that was uh, whether the causal factor reflects in any way on an airline or on a manufacturer or on, on any other element uh, involving a, an aircraft journey. So, uh, of course, every airline wants to, and or want is too weak a word, it, it has to focus on safety above anything. There is no other consideration in terms of a, an airline's reputation than, than offer, offering a, a safe and reliable service. And uh, no airline will attempt in any way to get any marketing mileage out of that or any kudos, uh, they, they just have to deliver that and uh, really uh, there but for the grace of God uh, in any airline. So there would be no, no uh, effort to use that in any way positively. If anything, if, if an airline is subject to an, an accident, uh, 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 then of course they will be uh, clear in showing their transparency and providing information about what happened, uh, showing due concern for the well-being of their customers and staff uh, as, as well, because uh, any, any indication of a lack of consideration for safety, uh, even it, without uh, a fatal accident, could be the end of an airline, because it simply could just, uh, just destroy reputation if there is a causal blame, which in this case there is not. Michelle, are procedures, but particularly from your perspective as a former air traffic controller, air traffic control procedures, are they global? Are they universal? Um, they do vary from uh, place to place because um, everyone has a slight local variation, but they are generally pretty much the same everywhere. And, and in terms of uh, the sort of lighting and, uh, and how things are highlighted for planes, is, is that again fa fairly universal? Yes, it is, because obviously if, if everywhere was different, then the pilots would never understand um, exactly what they're supposed to do. So there are global standards that keep most things the same, but as I said, there is the odd uh, little variation here and there. Uh, I, I sort of tee those two questions up to ask then, you know, whether, and again, there's, there's, a, there's an awful lot that we still don't know and we need to learn but before conclusions are made, but 
whether or not there are things that you would draw from this that it reminds you of from your time as an air traffic controller that should be in place that, that aren't in place? Sorry, Michelle? can you repeat the question? I, I lost you there for a moment. Are, are, are there certain rules uh, in the air traffic control world that you think should be in place that aren't in place that, that perhaps come back to the front of your mind uh, today? Or, or do you think largely, actually, uh, the world, and particularly, of course, um, the UK, from your perspective, ha have the right sort of rules and procedures in place? No, I do believe that, generally, when you look at how few accidents there are that where air traffic control is a factor, there's so few, and uh, even in this one, fortunately, um, all the occupants of the passenger jet actually managed to get out. So it's very, very rare that we have these sort of incidents. The last major one was uh, the Uberlingen, uh, crash where two aircraft collided mid-air, mid but it's very rare because we have such good safety procedures, not just the procedures, but the equipment. There's so many different warning systems now from uh, both on board the aircraft and for the controllers that, that it's very, very rare. Um, Alice, I just wanted to bring you back in and uh, another big picture question. The, the, the extent to which you would want to commend the pilot of the Japan Airlines uh, flight and his colleagues, both in the cockpit and, and the cabin crew, and indeed the passengers for uh, all that came together uh, this afternoon in, in Japan and successfully um, leading to at least the members of that uh, aircraft surviving? Well, it's always difficult to, 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 um, to, to, to answer that sort of question at this point. Uh, because one cannot know uh, whether or not mistakes have been made. Um, but on the face of it, it looks like it's been uh, handled well from the point of view of the A350 uh, crew. And, um, and I don't want to take anything away from what they have achieved there. You know, in aviation, if you can uh, if you walk away from an aircraft, it's, uh, it's, it's good news. And everybody did walk away from that aircraft, and that is good. Um, it, it's tragic what happened to the other aircraft um, uh, and to the uh, people on board that. Um, but, you know, it, it, I I'm, I'm always have to be very, very careful before you start uh, praising or, or doing the opposite, uh, before you are in possession of all the facts. Um, I, I just want to come back to uh, our reporter, Amelia Harper, who's here with me on set, uh, to, to remind any viewers that have just been joining us uh, of all of the key details of, of what's taken place today. Amelia? Well, to summarise, for those who are just joining us, that plane that we see on our screens now is a Japan Airlines plane that landed at Tokyo's Haneda Airport, and it's now been on fire for about four hours. The reason for this was that it collided with a smaller J Japan Coast Guard plane. This was flight number MA722, a much smaller plane, a Bombardier Dash 8, while landing. Uh, you can see on our screen there uh, the, the fireball that erupted as a result of it landing. Uh, state broadcaster NHK says five out of the six crew on board that smaller Coast Guard plane have died. The captain of that plane did manage to escape, yet to know his condition. And this was actually a plane on its way to deliver earthquake aid uh, to central Japan. But in terms of the plane that we can see coming down that runway on our screens now, this Japan airline flight A350, all 379 passengers and crew on board have been evacuated. Drastic footage there, fire engulfing the whole of the plane. More details, this Japan Airlines Flight 516 departed from Shin Chitose Airport on Hokkaido Island, flying uh, to Haneda. We've got their footage of the crash from inside of the cabin, uh, orange embers from the, the fire on the left-hand side of the plane there. All on board managed to escape without life-threatening injury, including uh, eight children. Uh, passengers, as I say, describe seeing that filling with smoke. You can see on the screen there two slides off the front nose of that plane. Passengers there trying uh, to depart. On that runway, uh, that has now been closed, as have all the other runways at this airport. All of the flights from that airport have now been stopped, and you can see they're continuing their uh, live pictures to spray water on the wreckage of that plane to try and put out what's left. And, uh, of course, John Strickland, uh, this is a, a terrible tragedy, and, and five members of, uh, of the Coast Guard lost their lives this afternoon in, in Japan. But given the numbers of, of, that we're talking about, it clearly could have been a, a greater tragedy in your position as a, a, a broader industry uh, expert, 
H have we had any other examples where th there's uh, such tragedies that have been could have been so big like this and have been avoided in a small way in recent years or not? You mean specifically in relation to collisions or, or more broadly? More, more broadly. Close, close shaves. Well, I mean, again, I, as we I, said, I it is a tragedy. Um, thinking of a, a, a fire situation, there was a case of uh, an Emirates uh, Airlines Boeing 777 uh, landing in uh, Dubai a few years ago. And uh, I think it, the pilot had to make a quite late decision to go around. I don't know the reasoning behind that, but it was unsuccessful. The aircraft ended up coming down anyway, couldn't take it up again. And uh, a similar situation. You know, initially, the aircraft came to a halt uh, and uh, they started the evacuation process. Uh, the aircraft was subsequently engulfed completely by flames and, and destroyed, but everybody got off that one. Um, I think in that situation, I think one firefighter lost their life and then uh, late last year or late in 2022 i think it was there was a, an airbus a320 of the airline latam taking off in uh, lima uh, in south america and uh, uh, a fire vehicle again uh, entered the runway and collided with that aircraft on takeoff and uh, again i think the the um the passengers and crew of the airliner were safe uh, but the crew of the ground fire vehicle lost their lives mm. Uh, well, John Strickland, thanks so much uh, for that perspective. Also to Alistair Rosenshine and to Michelle Robson for joining us in this uh, past hour. We're going to take a quick break here on Sky News, but much more coverage uh, of the fact that 379 passengers and crew are evacuated safely after their plane burst into flames, uh, although five members of the Coast Guard lost their life. Jane Secker has everything for you. I'm next.
helped avert a major catastrophe. The crash comes after an earthquake devastated large areas of the country's west coast. Investigators are now trying to establish why this happened and how two planes were on the same runway at the same time. Alex Rossi, Sky News. Well, Sky's Amelia Harper is here with me in the studio. And Amelia, it is astonishing, isn't it, given these images that we've been looking at all morning, the relatively low loss of life. Absolutely astonishing and a very fast-moving situation that we've seen here. This plane on that airport runway has been on fire for about four hours now. That is that Japan Airlines flight that was coming in uh, from Shinjitozi Airport, uh, landing there this morning. Uh, it collided with a smaller Japan Coast Guard plane. This was flight MA722, a Bombardier Dash 8. This is a smaller aircraft than this other one whilst it was landing. And as you said, uh, state broadcaster NHK saying five of the six crew on board this smaller Coast Guard plane have died. Uh, the captain of that plane did manage to escape, but we are yet to find out his condition. And this was a plane that was headed to central Japan to deliver uh, earthquake aid. But in, in better news, and as you are saying, all 379 passengers and crew on board that Japan airline A350 that we can still see there in those live pictures is still burning, uh, have been evacuated. All on board managed to escape without serious injury, a life-threatening injury, including uh, eight children. You can see those latest pictures, small fireballs there erupting from, from that plane. Uh, we have seen, of course, CCTV footage of that plane landing bursting into flames as it went along that runway. And we also have footage from inside the plane showing orange flames uh, erupting from underneath. Passengers, of course, worried uh, about what was going on and uh, smoke filling inside that cabin. Uh, you can see there on that right-hand side two slides where passengers were disembarking, evacuating there right at the corner. Uh, but as you see those live pictures, fire, fire engines are still there. Approximately 70 are there trying to put out uh, this blaze. And they have been there for some time and inevitably will be for a while longer. OK, thanks very much, Amelia. Well, let's uh, bring in John Lindsay, former head of air safety at British Airways for us. Uh, and, and John, you've obviously been uh, looking at this footage over the last few hours, listening to the, to the various forms of commentary. What do you think's happened here? Well, uh, it's easy to conjecture. I think, um, as some of your previous correspondents have said, that uh, we need to wait until we get all the facts. But on the evidence so far, obviously, the Japan Airlines aircraft was coming into land. The bombardier was presumably on the uh, occupying part of the runway uh, when the aircraft did uh, the a350 made its landing and the impact uh, judging by your video footage was at the touchdown zone in the runway the crew of the a350 maintained uh, directional control and kept the airplane on the runway very successfully uh, obviously there's no evidence as to what happened to the bombardier aircraft at this stage what would cause uh, a plane to be in the wrong place on a runway? Well, as your air traffic control correspondent uh, mentioned, there, there would be a number of factors that uh, could contribute to such a, an event. Uh, it's um, uh, There are some very well-documented um, incidents where similar uh, things have occurred. And it's usually, as your other correspondent mentioned, a, um, a, probably a chain of uh, failures rather than one single cause, that uh, these events don't tend to happen just because of a single error. It's usually a number of factors have contributed to, uh, to a failure, possibly in communications or uh, um, maybe mistakes being made in terms of identifying the uh, the proper signage for the runway. Uh, at this stage, uh, we don't have any evidence to indicate what may have gone wrong in that respect. The fact that it was it was night time that that shouldn't really have had an impact, should it? Uh, well, it 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 always will be a factor, I would guess, if the um, if a good visual contact is not as um, solid as it would have been in broad daylight. So, if if this uh, had 
incident had happened in the, in the middle of the day, uh, I, I'm sure one or other crew would have been able to identify uh, the aircraft. Um, uh, either or both of them were in a hazardous position. So, uh, so night and particularly in adverse weather and poor visibility is always going to contribute in some way to uh, to any of these incidents or accidents. And as we look at the image of the the plane landing and the, this pall of flames shooting out from behind it and the fact that all of those, it appears, all 379 passengers and crew on that Japan Airlines flight being safely evacuated. I mean, that's, it's, that's an astonishing success story, isn't it, in terms of the, the kind of procedures that they have in place to get people off a plane quickly? It does, and it's a real testimony um, to the crew on the day. Uh, it's um, it, it's very nice to think that everyone has trained uh, very well for these things, and in fact that they had uh, half the number of uh, um, egress uh, opportunities uh, in terms of the, the three slides that were operating um, as against the full complement um, indicates that it was conducted in almost, I would say, exemplary fashion. And uh, I, I think as uh, one of your other correspondents mentioned that it's a real testimony to the, uh, to the discipline of the culture in Japan where such an orderly evacuation could occur without any injuries at all. And in terms of the, the airport itself, clearly, you know, the operation to, to get this fire fully out is still underway. But, I mean, how quickly do you think it, it could reopen? Because there'll be many people who will be needing to travel in and out of this hub. Uh, that's, uh, I, th I think, beyond my uh, <laughs> level of uh, authority to comment on, really. It's... Uh, um, uh, 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 it would depend on a whole raft of factors, um, and I uh, would anticipate that the airport will probably be re remain closed for some time yet. Um, it may be, in, in these cases, on very large air airports uh, that with other runways available, that um, the limited operations can be conducted on, on different runways. But my recollection of Haneda is uh, that it, it, whilst it is an incredibly busy airport, it's uh, very compact um, adjacent to the city. And um, I, I would guess that they would have limited opportunities for um, bringing um, other runways into operation at short notice just to accommodate uh, continued traffic, albeit that they've also have Narita as an available airport to serve the city in the meantime. OK. Uh, John Lindsay, former head of air safety at British Airways, good to talk to you. Uh, we're going to continue to bring you a lot more on this developing story here on Sky News. At half 12, we're going to be talking back again to Alastair Rosenstein as well, um, so stay with us for that. But in the meantime, well, let's just move on to the place that the Japanese Coast Guard plane was on its way to deliver aid to. And this was the series of powerful earthquakes that hit the west of the country, killing 48 people. Homes and vehicles were damaged, with water, power and mobile phone services still down in some areas. Japan's military has dispatched a thousand soldiers to the disaster zones to join the rescue efforts. The earthquakes centre around Ishikawa and Toyama prefectures on the west coast of Japan's main island. Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida says it's difficult to enter the northern Noto Peninsula, the epicentre of the quake, with fears of a tsunami now being downgraded.
総理、羽田空港で日航機と海上保安庁の航空機との衝突事故が発生し、斉藤大臣は先ほど5名の死亡を発表されました、はい、事故による乗客・乗員への被害状況など、現在入っている情報等を受け止めをお願いします。また、政府として今後の対応についてお考えがあればお,お聞かせください。はい。はい、えっ、ー、と、まずあの先ほど、えー、航空行政と、まあ、海上保安庁を、まあ、所管する、まあ、斉藤国土交通大臣から、えー、報告を受けました。あそ,しその中で、まあ、本日17時47分ごろ、えー、日航機と海上保安庁機が、まあ、接触、炎上し、ました日航の職員の方々、また空港の職員の皆さん、また乗客の皆さんの冷静な対応によって、日航機の乗員・乗客379名は全員脱出できたということであり、このことについては感謝を申し上げます。他方能登地震の対応のために、この搭乗していた解放職員6名のうち5名は死亡したという報告を受けました。この方々は、被災地、被災者のために高い使命感、責任感を持って、職に当たっておられた職員であり、えー、大変残念なことであり、えー、その、うんまあ、使命感に敬意と感謝を表しながら、哀悼の誠を捧げる、まあ、次第です、えーそ。そのさらなるこの事故の詳細については、この後、国土交通省の方から会見を行って、えー、説明をすると承知しております。えー、詳細はそ,そちらで確認をしていただきたいと思います。以上です、はいえー、今回の地震による被害状況について、現時点で把握されている最新の情報と、明日以降の政府の対応を教えてください。また、羽田空港での航空機の衝突について、海保機は能登半島地震の対応で物資を輸送中でしたが、今後の被災地支援への影響について、どうお考えかお聞かせください。はい、あのまず、まあ、地震の発生から、まあ、24時間以上が経ち、えー、被害の状況、うん、その大きさ、えー、次第に明らかになってきております。あの政府としては、まあ、自衛隊、警察、消防の、まあ、緊急援助隊を、まあ、現地で、まあ、展開をし、えー、被災者。On the runway at the airport after colliding. It's believed with a Japanese Coast Guard plane, which was already on the runway, a much, much smaller plane, a Bombardier Dash 8 plane. The captain of that plane, we think, escaped, but it's feared that five people, the crew members on board that aircraft, are reported to have died.、Uh, that was the smaller plane was on its way to deliver aid to people caught up in that powerful earthquake that struck. Japan yesterday. But this much larger plane, well on light, well on fire, is a Japan Airlines flight JAL 516. Now, this left New Chitose Airport on the northern island of Hokkaido、uh, for Tokyo、uh, at around quarter past four local time. And as it landed at that airport、uh, just after a, a quarter to six,、uh, a flight time just of an hour and a half. Uh, there was this collision, and we saw the footage、uh, of the plane、uh, coming along the runway、uh, with flames streaming away from it.、Uh, cameras catching the moment that that plane burst into flames.、Uh, and then what happened next? We were able to see images from inside、uh, the plane, which filmed by a passenger, which showed the moment of landing, flames visible from outside the window. So clearly a terrifying experience for those passengers on board this plane. But remarkably, All 379 passengers and crew on this flight were safely evacuated. They deployed the slides from two different doors on the plane towards the rear of the plane,、uh, and the passengers really, really quickly got off that plane. 
Now, just talking to air safety experts throughout the course of the morning, it is possible to evacuate a plane in a matter of, of a minute to 90 seconds, apparently, and it appears that as soon as this plane uh, taxied to a halt, that they managed to get everybody off this plane really, really quickly. Now, of course, the plane coming in to land also speculation that had this enormous plane been taking off and been full of fuel it would have been a very very different picture but possibly because the plane had actually uh, already uh, completed its journey that may have, have led to a slightly happier outcome uh, but clearly still uh, a very difficult outcome for uh, the those on board the coast guard plane the pilot escaping but the other five crew members on board that aircraft are reported to have died uh, some speculation that it could have been on the wrong place on the wrong runway possibly uh, at this airport there is of course, a great deal of speed inside Japan as they try to get aid out to the areas that have been affected by the earthquakes over the last few days. And this Coast Guard plane was going to be delivering vital supplies to one of the worst hit areas, but unfortunately it never managed to take off. We've been getting some comments uh, from the Japanese Prime Minister uh, in the last few minutes, uh, Fumio Kishida, and also the Minister of Land, Infrastructure, Transport and Tourism, Tetsuo Saiti, uh, who are making comments uh, on this plane that caught fire on the runway of Tokyo's Haneda Airport. I think we might be able to bring you those comments. Let's listen in. え、そしその中でま、本日uh, staff at the site. Uh, we have had a report that all of the 379 passengers plus crew are now safe and evacuated from the aircraft. I'd like to express my heartfelt gratitude for the efforts. Now, uh, for the Noto Peninsula disaster, uh, there were six Coastal Guard crew on board their aircraft, of which five have passed away. And they were on their way with a high sense of duty uh, to deliver goods to the disaster-stricken area. It is a very disappointing and saddening situation. I'd like to express my respect towards their sense of duty as well as offer my heartfelt condolences for their losses. The details of this disaster will be explained by a press conference which will be held by the Ministry of Land, Infrastructure and Tourism. So please do check that press conference for the details of the collision. That's it. So could we get the latest uh, status of the disaster on the ground and what is the government thinking of uh, in terms of their response tomorrow? And about the uh, humanitarian aid towards the disaster screening area, how would that impact? So since the earthquake struck, it's been 24 hours. Um, and gradually the situation on the ground, the scale of the disasters is getting more clear. We have the fire department, police department, self-defense forces on the ground. And they are uh, putting their utmost efforts um, to uh, go into humanitarian rescue efforts. There may be some more survivors who may be in the rubble of the buildings that have collapsed on the ground. I, I have been talking to the governor of Ishikawa, Ishigawa, Ishikawa Hase, Sakaguchi Mayor, who is uh, from uh, um, Wajima, and Mayor Izumiya of Zushi, 
we have talked by telephone and online conferences. I directly ask them for what they need exactly. Um, in order to bolster rescue activities, they ask for bolstering of rescue dogs on the ground. And for the governor and mayor, they have said that, especially in regards to Ms. Wajima City, um, they want the roads to be cleared as soon as possible to allow access. They want water, fuel, and humanitarian aid in the area. And uh, they would like a better communication access with the government. And in order to do this, uh, they would require uh, some staff who are experts in disaster management. So we have had these detailed requests from people on the ground. So based on that, I am uh, trying to set up a team uh, that can, for certain, uh, deploy uh, such expertise in the front lines. I will also bolster rescue dogs. We will also be transporting humanitarian goods, including blankets and water. This will be a push type effort. And all of this information will, of course, be uh, ex uh, communicated to the local municipalities. We'll also be trying to look for the experts in disaster management. So from our side, we have given um, instructions on the, to the relevant uh, municipalities. And clearing of the roads, we uh, have had the self-defense forces clearing the rock and rubble in those areas. I have had reports that this is now underway and we are starting to clear away the um, uh, blockades. I mentioned that we are starting the push type transport of the humanitarian goods. This is underway. And also rescue dogs are also being looked at um, through self-defense forces and the police department. Uh, we are getting clear outlook on when that can be uh, those dogs can be delivered. So in order to discuss further actions at 10 o'clock tomorrow, we will have the second emergency response meeting. Of course, um, we are working on the safety of people first. We are uh, in battle with trying to provide these activities and rescue efforts as soon as possible. Every second counts. We are working closely with the municipalities and the local people uh, on the ground. Now, in regards to the impact of the aircraft collision, is this. We are trying to respond in the most appropriate manner so that it does not have any negative impact on the rescue efforts. We are working with the relevant agencies to understand, first of all, the impact it may have and try to respond so that there is no negative impact on the ref rescue efforts. That's it. Thank you very much. Well, that there, uh, Fumio Kishida, the Japanese Prime Minister, giving an update on uh, two disasters to have affected his country in, in 24 hours. Uh, first of all, about this plane crash at Haneda Airport. Uh, he thanked uh, the crew uh, who managed to get everybody safely off that plane, all 37 nine, 379 passengers and crew of that Japan Airlines flight. He expressed his heartfelt gratitude to them for their help but uh, expressed his condolences to those who died on board the Coast Guard plane. Six on board, five passed away. He said that they were on their way to, with a high sense of duty to deliver goods to the disaster-struck area and offers his heartfelt sorrow. Uh, now we're getting an update from the Minister of Land, Infrastructure, Transport and Tourism, Tetsuo Saito. First of all, about the accident at Haneda um, airport. I'm sure um, that the people of Jam will have um, severe concerns in regards to this accident. I've just reported to Prime Minister Kishida, and we have been given instructions to respond to this incident. First of all, on this particular case, uh, it was a Japan Airlines flight 
516 coming in from New Chitose Airport into Haneda. And this aircraft collided on runway C of Haneda Airport with a Coastal Guard aircraft. There were 376, uh, 379 people on board, 367 passengers and 12 crew have now all been safely evacuated from the plane. But on the Coastal Guard aircraft, the captain had managed to escape, but the remaining five crew on board uh, have passed away. This has been confirmed, and I've just received the report to back this up. The re root cause of this accident is not known yet, but we will be looking to work with Japan Transport Safety Board and the relevant agencies associated with the police department. Uh, we will be looking into some of the information gathering in detail, and we will be making the utmost effort as the Ma uh, Ministry of Land Infrastructure and Transport to uh, uh, work out and analyze the root cause of this accident. The operation of Haneda Airport is as follows. First, uh, we want to secure the accident area. But of course, uh, we are trying to work so that other aircraft can operate back to normal uh, timetable. So we are trying to secure the disaster area, plus trying to reopen the remainder of the airport to restart operations. Um, these two points are what I reported to the Prime Minister. And he has said, uh, four given us four instructions, four points. One, so close communication with the relevant agencies Please put your best efforts to the rescue of the, of the people in the disaster-stricken uh, area. The second point is to provide um, as much information as possible to the public, uh, trying to um, make sure that we have a root cause of the accident. And please make sure to respond to the people who are on site at the aircraft disaster area and to provide support for them as much as possible. And trying our best to try and resume operation from tomorrow onwards back to normal timetable for the Haneda airports operations. So for us as the ministry, we will be looking to work out the root cause of that accident. Afterwards, there will be a, a press conference uh, from the administrative side to report on the details of the accident. That's it from my side. Is there any updates from the latest information? Currently, the root cause of the accident um, has not uh, been uh, thoroughly analyzed yet. And for the uh, captain who had escaped, um, He's injured, but I don't know any further information in regards to the situation. And originally that Coastal Guard aircraft was supposed to deliver uh, humanitarian goods to Niigata Airport. And this coastal um, aircraft belongs to a base which belongs to the coastal aircraft, which was going to be used for tra tra the transport of goods. Is there any impact on the rescue efforts because of the accident? Of course, this aircraft is on fire. But of course, we can't use this aircraft. There will be some impact to the hum um, rescue efforts. 
But of course, for the remaining operations, we will be doing our best to try to minimize the impact uh, for the rest of the transport of humanitarian goods. We have already reported to the Japan Transport Safety Board. The accident root cause is start, the, in starting its investigations now. And of course, we will be working together with relevant agencies to try and come to the root cause and try to avoid this uh, situation happening again. How long do we expect the runway uh, to be shut down? For the remaining runways A, B, and D, we are trying to get these up and running as soon as possible, if possible today, uh, but we are trying to reopen them by tomorrow at latest. So this will conclude the uh, press conference with the M uh, Minister of Land Infrastructure and Transport. There, Tetsu Saito, uh, the Minister of Land Infrastructure, Transport and Tourism, giving uh, an update. A couple of extra facts that we gleaned from that: the runway, runway C, it was that this these flights collided upon, um, and that they are trying really hard to get the airport open as early potentially as today. The three other runways, A, B and D, he said, could reopen as soon as possible. Uh, if not today, then hopefully by tomorrow uh, at the latest. Uh, let's bring in uh, Amelia Harper, who's here in, in the studio with me. Um, no real idea of the root cause, both of, of, of the Prime Minister and the Minister pressed by the journalists there on what on earth has caused this. Uh, no, no news yet on that but both an undertaking to take part in uh, an investigation to find out as soon as possible. Absolutely. Well, investigations will be going as fast as they can. They're working still in a very dangerous environment. We can see there those live images, lots of emergency individuals uh, and equipment still on scene there. But hearing there from the Prime Minister of Japan and the Transport uh, Minister, the Prime Minister Fumio Kishida, confirming that collision between a passenger aircraft and a Coast Guard aircraft. He said, I'd like to express my heartfelt gratitude for the efforts to evacuate the passenger plane. He also said it's a very disappointing and saddening uh, situation. He went on and said we're trying to respond in the most appropriate manner so it doesn't impact on rescue efforts. Of course, they will be still dealing with a 7.6 magnitude earthquake in the west of Japan. Two big major incidents that authorities in Japan will be dealing with. We also had, as I said, more information from uh, the Transport Minister Tetsuo Saito confirming that it was the Japan Airlines flight coming into the airport and it collided on runway C with the Coast Guard aircraft. 379 individuals were on board, 12 were crew on the right-hand side of our screen there. You can see the inside of the cabin. And there we have CCTV footage of that plane actually landing on that uh, runway. Uh, we know that the Coast Guard plane captain is injured, but he didn't provide any further information on uh, any injuries or, or his current state. And that plane that he was captaining was supposed to deliver aid to Nagata Airport for that uh, earthquake. Uh, that root cause, as you said, still unknown, but they're working with the accident board to try to establish what has happened. OK, Amelia, thanks so much for that. Uh, the latest that we're getting uh, from uh, both the Prime Minister and the Minister of Land, Infrastructure, Transport and Tourism. They said that there's going to be a further press conference in a little while. No idea on the time and when that is going to be as yet as they continue to try to work out the root cause of what happened here. Uh, let's bring in Alistair Rosenschein, a former British Airways pilot. Um, Alistair, uh, good to talk to you today. Uh, what do you think will have been the first that the pilot of this Japan Airlines plane knew something was wrong. Uh, hello, uh, yes. Um, uh, am I... Uh, can you hear me? Yes, Alistair, we can hear you loud and clear. I was just wondering, you know, from your experience, um, what do you think will have been the first that the pilot realised something was, was wrong? I mean, would, would he have seen this plane, do you think, or would, have, would it literally have been the moment of impact? He probably saw it very, very last uh, second before before impact, uh, if not uh, when when it actually impacted. It, it, you know, at night it's difficult to see exactly um, what's on the runway because the, the runway lights are very bright indeed. 
And uh, when an aircraft touches down, you pitch the nose up slightly to reduce the rate of descent for the actual touchdown. So you can lose uh, vis visual sight of anything that might be near the touchdown point just off, in this case, to the left of the cockpit. Uh, but, you know, nonetheless, we will have known something happened as soon as they, uh, they collided. Um, and at that point, his role is to keep the aircraft as straight as possible down the runway, bring the aircraft to a halt and then com commence the evacuation. And in terms of how well that was executed, it seems to have been textbook. It pretty much does look that way. Um, yes, it does. Um, the fact that everybody got off safely, alive, uninjured is just fantastic news because, you know, this, this is a major accident and uh, it could have been so much worse. So, uh, you know, hats off to the crew for uh, the evacuation. They certainly got that done um, perfectly well, and the uh, and the crew keeping the aircraft on the runway uh, with uh, what would obviously be really difficult control um, situation with the nose wheel gone, um, and we don't know how the rest of the controls were affected. Certainly, one of the engines will have um, will have been destroyed in the in this accident, from what we can see in the pictures, um, and uh, you know they wouldn't have been able to use uh, or very unlikely to have been able to use reverse thrust to bring the aircraft to a halt. So yes, it looks like they did the best of um, the best they could possibly have done in this situation. And obviously, all crew and, and uh, are, are all trained uh, very, very regularly and have repeat training in how to cope with, with when disasters happen. But actually, having experience of it in real life is it, far, far rarer. Well, the thing is to try and remain calm uh, because. Fear is uh, a very, very strong emotion, and there will have been fear amongst everybody, the, the crew and the passengers alike. Um, so the crew have to just concentrate very hard on what they have to do to get everybody out and, uh, and to do so in a timely fashion, because there's very little time to lose when you have a fire on an aircraft. So they've, they've, done, they've done well in this, in this respect. Were you surprised by how the footage that we have from, from inside that, that we can see here it appears to be uh, relatively calm? Not, not quite sure I would have coped with it quite that calmly. Are you, are you surprised by how well the passengers appear to have coped here? Well, assuming that they, uh, that they didn't panic and that they uh, followed the instructions that they were given before takeoff and then by the cabin crew at the time when the accident occurred, then... Uh, then, yes, that's really good. I mean, panic is, is a, a terrible thing to have on an aircraft, especially in a fire situation. There have been some um, terrible cases where uh, panics ensued and the passengers have actually piled up by the, by the exit doors, preventing the cabin crew from opening the doors, and then uh, people have lost their lives. In fact, um, they've been, you know, it's well documented of how these things can go so terribly wrong in what should have otherwise have been uh, a relatively safe evacuation. So here it has worked smoothly. It appears to be smoothly. Everybody's got off, you know, and, and that, that's really a real, a real success story. Uh, not so successful, sadly, for those on board the Coast Guard plane. The pilot we, we know has survived, but not, not sure about injuries. Other five crew members on board that aircraft are now reported to have died. Uh, and in terms of that plane, potentially being in the wrong place at the wrong time. What are the factors that, that, that we should be, be looking at that, that could have contributed to that? Human error, presumably, uh, very largely uh, likely to be a factor here. Everything involving aviation uh, has a human error factor, um, or human factor, let's put it that way, um, because it's a, it's a human pastime. Um, now, something went wrong. What is a, a likely scenario is that uh, the Coast Guard aircraft entered the runway uh, unintentionally. Uh, that, that, you know, that's a speculation. I don't think it's uh, uh, crazy to suggest that, but uh, runway incursions can occur, they do occur, uh, both through um, you know, uh, the ground movement um, vehicles, like uh, they use cars and uh, lorries and other vehicles on, on airports, and they can sometimes uh, cross a runway when they shouldn't. You know, it's, it's difficult to become disorientated in, uh, at night especially. 
at a complex airport like uh, Haneda. If you look at a, a map of the airport, it has uh, numerous taxiways. It has uh, three main runways and uh, a fourth one, which is just off the, uh, which is actually more like an island uh, in the sea. But, you know, it is, it, it is easily done entering a runway when you shouldn't. And I'm, I'm not saying that that's definitely what happened here. It does look that way. Uh, but we have to wait and see what the investigation shows. As you can heard from the uh, transport minister there, he was very circumspect. He, he wouldn't give a, a reason for the accident. He said they were looking into it. And, uh, you know, a full report will take probably a year and a half to come out, but an interim report. And it's very important they get a very quick understanding as to what could be learnt and therefore avoided from happening again. OK, Alistair, Alistair Rosenstein, really good to talk to you, a former British Airways pilot. Thanks so much for, for joining us here on Sky. We could take a short break in a moment, but before that, uh, just a bit of break news we can bring you to tell you that last year was provisionally the second warmest year in the UK since records began, according to the Met Office. Uh, they are pointing to the growing impact of human-induced climate change, they say, on the country's average temperatures. Heat waves in June and September, as well as the...
but the other five did not survive. The plane had been loaded with aid to help victims of the earthquake, which devastated large areas of the country's west coast. This is one of the busiest times of year at one of the world's busiest airports. The JAL flight had flown out of Shinchitose Airport in northern Japan before the disaster happened. More than 70 fire engines were scrambled into action, and clearly the speed of all involved in the rescue helped avert a major catastrophe. Investigators are now trying to establish why this happened and how two planes were on the same runway at the same time. Alex Rossi, Sky News. Now, the government's been accused of making misleading claims around the handling of the legacy asylum claim backlog. The Home Office says it's cleared more than 100,000 historical cases. Labour says those figures fail to account for those who drop out of the system. In December 2022, Rishi Sunak pledged to abolish a legacy backlog of more than 92,000 asylum claims made before the end of June that year. The Home Office says all cases in that legacy backlog have now been reviewed. 